The draft is in the rearview mirror, and we're going to shift our sights forward to look at every fantasy relevant player from every single round. Plus, the UN score is here. Let's get it. Pulling apart the fantasy football fabric one thread at a time, this is Unraveled. I am Trav, hosting and West Coastin. We are posted up on the Undroppables YouTube channel as always. Subscribe to it, like the video, leave us a comment. That really does go a long way for us, I can't say enough. Uh, we have seen incremental growth in subscribers over the past couple of months and we cannot thank you enough for that. Keep it locked, keep it dialed, hit the notification button to see all of the new stuff that's coming up because there is a bunch of it this team is firing and speaking of with me as always is the freak in the sheets mr dan wisner changed his twitter handle this week and i'm having a hard time <laughs> coping with it but wiz how's it going bro what's up man how are you it's been a uh it's been a really busy past few days with you know like the score that you mentioned coming out today which was super exciting uh obviously the draft over the weekend tons tons to uh talk through today but um, yeah, man, looking forward to it. it. Should be a really fun show. Yeah, it's gonna be great, man. This show, uh, it's gonna be thick uh, with yeah. two C's. To quote our man Scott Barrett from last week's episode, "Thick with two C's." Might even throw a third C on this one, Wiz. <laughs> um, we're gonna go through every round of the draft, basically hit on every fantasy relevant player that we saw selected, and it's gonna be a good time. Uh, but first, Wiz, I do want to talk about what I mentioned on the pre-open. The UN score is live at theundroppables.com. Just launched this week. I'm not sure when you're listening to this, but it launched on April 30th, Tuesday, and we couldn't be more excited about it. Early reception has been incredible from people. Lots of questions, which is what we wanted. Lots of people digging in and trying to see how they can translate this into their fantasy league. So been really cool to watch. It's As of this recording, we're probably looking at about like 10 hours that it's been out, if that. Um, and yeah, we're seeing a lot of people pick it up and uh, have a look. And it's been fun in the Discord chat. So if you want to know where to find that, it is um, at theundroppables.com. And you can get all of the classes from 2018 through to 2024 for only 20 bucks. Uh, definitely a little bit of a different number if you use Monopoly like money like us Canadians. Um, but uh, still worth it nonetheless and so i'm gonna lay a little groundwork whiz and because you put so much blood sweat and tears into this bad boy i'm gonna give you the floor um, but this sure. is our proprietary prospect model for wide receivers um and we're just super excited about it right 54 pages this thing is yeah. a huge piece lots of blood sweat and tears including from yourself so i just want to give a shout out as well to dukes to coder to jay or um jay is coder uh to chalk to jacks um huge huge efforts by the team we were in the group chats late last night putting it all together with so how pumped are you about the launch of the un score yeah i mean it's super exciting right like there was a lot of it's been probably you know we're at the end of april here it's probably been about four months in the making so uh you know really almost close to five because it was really kind of right after the new year so you know the fact that kind of seeing it come from its inception back in january talking through all those early conversations you know about what's going to go into it what it's going to look like um you know lots of testing done and you know kind of ridicule going through it um as you know from ourselves internally um and then just watching it come together at the end here right like i think you know seeing what how you know dukes was able to put his special touch on it here for us just really made it something that we're all really proud of um you know i think from a quality standpoint it looks fantastic and one of the really nice touches that we had in there you know towards the end was just really getting in all those stats in addition to the un score right so you know there's college career stats in there for all 215 wide receivers so you know as you kind of go back and look at some of the older classes to get an idea of you know why who scored what um you know you can reference those stats right in there as well so i get i think dukes put it really well earlier trav it's been a labor of love but um you know it's nice to hear you know people are checking it out and you know we're looking forward to some of the feedback and conversations that you know it generates yeah, man. And like uh, like Jay said at the bottom of the introduction, uh, it's not I don't know exactly how he worded it. I probably won't say it as eloquently as he did in the paragraph there. Uh, something to the effect that it is but a tool in your tool belt, yes. uh, but it's a pretty damn good hammer. So we're super excited for people to use that and put it in their tool belt 
feel free to engage with it engage with us on socials if you want to know more about it or you got any questions we love that and yeah if you want to pick it up go to the undroppables.com 20 dollars for seven draft classes 2018 through 2024 but if you sign up for the expert tier of our patreon you'll get the 2024 class for completely free and the 2020 or 2018 through 2023 classes will be discounted to only 10 bucks. So get in there. We'll give you a promo code for all the historical classes and you'll get this year's draft class for free. So yeah, everything that Wiz said, just a labor of love and big shout out to the team for putting that together and shout out to the rest of the Undroppables team for promoting it, just being a part of the squad and championing this for us because it's been uh, pretty exciting and without having everybody in the group chat getting fired up, uh, it might've been just a smidgen less exciting, although still yeah. very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, it was about as uh, about as a good of a group effort as you could have, Trav. So really proud of the team. Yeah, love to see it. Love to see it, man. And uh, now that we got those sweet nothings out of the way, as is customary for us, uh, we're going to yeah. talk about tonight's episode. Uh, and we need to get moving, Wiz, because it's a big one. Uh, yeah. We're going to go through each round. We're going to talk about the fantasy relevant players, maybe how we see them fitting into their new offenses. Talk a little bit about rookie draft value and all of that jazz cabbage. What we aren't going to do, which we might do on a normal episode, is get a little bit deeper in the weeds with some data digs. Maybe we you know, normally would throw some stats into why for a lot of things. We haven't really gotten there necessarily yet because it is still early after the draft. We're putting rankings together, putting the UN score together. But throughout the offseason, we got lots of time to do that. We're going to get better insight as to the usage some of these guys get. We're going to see how the veterans around them are shaping up. So I think this is just the start. We're basically just laying the foundations. And throughout the offseason, we're going to frame up the walls. We're going to put some trusses on, get some shingles on that bad boy. And we hope you come and visit over at Unraveled. So the draft this year, Wiz, was extremely fun. Extremely fun, especially on my end. It was a huge draft for Howie and my Eagles. Uh, to quote Snoop Dogg, this motherfucker don't miss. Because Howie <laughs> Roseman just does not miss. He had a masterful draft and I love what he did. And it might not have been sexy from like a wide receiver running back quarterback perspective, but from a real football chance at a Super Bowl perspective, I think it was incredible. And then it was a huge draft for you as well with the Patriots whiz. Um, as a Pats fan, uh, you know, it must have been pretty up and down. In fact, I know it was pretty up and down <laughs> for me as a bystander. The the tilting that was taking place in the group chat. I think there's yep. three or four of you guys on the team that are Patriots fans. And uh, it was just electric. The rest of us are just kind of sitting back, letting you guys cook. And it was a yeah. good time. So did you have fun at the draft? Let's start with that, Wiz. Yeah, I did. I mean, look, it was uh, definitely a stressful night. I think as we got up closer to the draft, we kind of realized that, look, it was going to start to play out like we're going to be taking Drake May. Um, you know, I think there was some people were wondering, are we going to take the plunge on that trade offer or anything like that that, you know, came through? And, you know, I know there's many opinions kind of out there right now of should we have, should we not have, you know, internally here at the Undroppables, we're kind of going through that right now. I've actually been referencing it as, you know, like our internal civil war. Um, you know, between, <laughs> between Jack, Stan, myself and, uh, but yeah, ultimately I'm happy, Trav. Um, you know, I, again, not all these guys are going to work out. Obviously we look at some of the hit rates of these top quarterbacks, but you know, look, they liked their guy. I'm glad they took the shot. And I think the thing that I'm more encouraged about than anything is, you know, after they went ahead and took Drake may, they, you know, started to lay the foundation of the support system for him. Right. So, um, that did not come without tilting from my end as well. But I think, you know, at the end of the weekend, I feel good about, you know, this is step one in the right direction, right? Totally, man. And uh, I hate to cut off your piss there on the Patriots, but we will talk about them. But a couple of guys to get through before that was first round pick one, Caleb yep. Williams, as we expected. We already did kind of talk about his outlook coming into the Bears, and we like everything we see. We like what they've built around them. But speaking of, the Bears doubled back with the ninth pick, and I think this was your call a few episodes ago, in fact, Wiz, um, was that Romo Dunze could be the pick at nine just to shore up that wide receiver core. We know Kate, uh, Keenan Allen could be gone after this season. Uh, DJ Moore is there, but they wanted to make sure that they had a young stalwart to grow along with Caleb Williams. Um, so I just want you to give the flavor of this offense um, any different stance than we had a couple episodes ago where we thought this was all good, but maybe some early bumps in the road for Odunze. Where are you sitting on the Chicago Bears? 
You know, I do think there's going to be some early bumps for Odunze, but, you know, it's obviously when you have guys like DJ Moore and Keenan Allen there, right? Like, you know, he's going to have to come in and those are guys that are two big time target share guys, right? We saw that last year. Um, but, you know, if we start with Caleb and what this means from his standpoint for, you know, as far as the fantasy outlook, um, you know, it's pretty hard not to like what they've put together for him there. You know, given he's walking into arguably like one of the best situations the number one pick has walked into. Um, and when you kind of take into account, you know, the generational kind of prospect that he is, um, there's a lot to like there, right, Trav? So, but from an Odunze perspective, I, I think patience is going to be kind of key. Um, it's also going to be really interesting to see how Shane Waldron handles this, right? Because he was actually over that Seattle offense last year. Um, and there's a lot of rhetoric online right now about, you know, is Odunze kind of set up for that JSN type year one, right? So it'll be, the thing is, those are two different players. Um, so that's why I'm really curious to see, you know, how Waldron involves Odunze. Um, but I look, I think he's a fantastic player. He's, you know, he's, I love the way he like just schematically wins and his smoothness and everything like that. Um, but I do think there's going to be you know, going to have to be some patience breach kind of from day one, Trav. Where are you at on Odunze? Do you think there's going to be some early bumps? Or are you like hot out of the gates? Let's go. Where, what are you feeling? Uh, maybe like a mix of both. Like I'm expecting that his rookie season is not going to be on the level of say Marvin Harrison or Malik neighbors, sure. maybe even yeah. a couple of these other guys behind that we might talk about. You know what I mean? But uh, I think for the long term, it's the same eval as I had beforehand. Like this guy is going yeah. to grow into an alpha wide receiver one. I don't call him alpha Romeo for no reason. Um, so I'm still super bullish and excited. And I would draft, I would probably draft him at the same spot. I would have drafted him in rookie drafts previous to this just because of what he should end up becoming. Like, I'm not going to puff any of those guys that were drafted behind him above Odunze just for what that ultimate upside would be, as opposed to maybe taking the hit long-term just to take some early production. I don't think that's necessarily worth it, even on a win-now team, you know? Keenan Allen catches an injury. Romo Dunze is, like, a top-20 wide receiver, most likely. So I'm still in on Romo Dunze. And I think to go back to Caleb Williams there, I was doing my dynasty rankings with actually yeah. haven't done the wide receivers yet. So I'll just say that just because I need to have some time to put into them. There is a lot more names in the other positions. These rookies sure. are bringing forth a lot more questions in my mind. So a little bit of work left to do on the wide receivers, but for Caleb Williams, uh, and I'm just doing best ball rankings so far, and then I will do my redraft, but best ball almost mirrors redraft rankings. Um, and Caleb Williams is currently my quarterback 13 from a best ball lens. And I think that's pretty reasonable for where he could sit. Um, and as far as sorry, dynasty, he's up in that quarterback six range. So Wiz, I kind of want to ask you how high you might have him up in your dynasty rankings. And we're going to do some either ors here Wiz, because I think without having a bunch of context around how these guys are going to be used, we know landing spot, and I kind of want to just see in air in certain areas where we might value got these guys from a dynasty perspective. Um, Absolutely. We will bring some rookie mock takes in because we did a couple of those earlier in the week as well. But for Caleb Williams, I think we know easily he is the quarterback one in this class. So next step is to translate him forward into where he sits with the veterans. So um, Caleb Williams or Joe Burrow for dynasty? See, this is, like, I think you said, I think right now I'll take... This is tough, Trev. Um, mm -hmm. You start no no layups to start here, huh? Right well, now, I'll go Joe. <laughs> right now, I'll go Joe Burrow. Um, it's I, I think it's close though. I think you mentioned what you have him at seven. Uh, I have Burrow at eight, or sorry, Burrow at eight, Richardson at seven, Caleb Williams at six. Okay. All yeah. Right. Yeah. For for now, I'll go Burrow. Okay. Okay. Um, so I don't know if I necessarily even have to go like too, too much higher just cause I think we're no. right in that range. Like he's probably in yeah. the nine area for you, nine or 10 kind of thing. Um, yeah, I just think for me, it's kind of wheels up and the attachment of Romo Dunze helped me be confident in this. Right. But I think six to 10 it could go either yep. way because all of these guys have some serious upside. I just think if he does bake in a little bit of rushing with what that passing upside could be, I think he does have some, have some of that ultimate upside. So, yeah. And look, I think he does Trav, right? Like we saw enough of it in college where that, that should be an element of his game, right? It's not like we should just expect for him to just drop back and, and have to rely on his passing for that production. Um, I will say, I don't think it's going to take me much to see, you know, if he comes out hot out of the gates here, 
and just really kind of reinforces that, you know, he's a fit in that offense and, you know, he's taking to the NFL life pretty quickly here. It's really not going to take me much. I'm not going to be like, Hey, I need to see a ton of it to move him up there. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm fluid on him right now. Yeah. So as, as we have to be right, because it's yeah. that, that high valued of an asset, we kind of have to be fluid. Can't be super reactionary a sure. couple of days after the draft. So I really like that stance whiz and like i'm not like that's a pretty high ranking for him right i think just the guys behind have some more questions like Ant anthony richardson we've seen like a game and a half of game and a half of nfl play uh joe burrow justin herbert Tua uh, don't bring much rushing so i think they kind of need like a big blow up 4540 touchdown season to be able to get into that top five most likely so that's kind of why i would have caleb there um but i'm not saying there aren't avenues for him to fail too right like if we look and we talk about my guy, Jaden Daniels. A lot of people have been linking him to the Justin Fields situation, thinking that he might not have a very long leash if he were to falter early in his career. And I don't think enough stock has been put into the, the uh, Caleb Williams, Trevor Lawrence potential comparison because Trevor Lawrence was the last quote unquote generational quarterback prospect that we had. Sure. Um, and we haven't seen quite those results, albeit a worse situation for Lawrence to go into than Caleb Williams. Um, but aside from those those weapons like I do like Shane Waldron but I think as far as the Sean McVay disciples go he might be one of the least desirable ones like I don't think he was putting out lights out offenses in Seattle necessarily yep. um, but he also didn't have the quarterback so I could eat crow on that one I definitely could another factor here that I was kind of mulling over that I just kind of don't like and it holds true for a couple of these guys is the vaunted defensive head coach offensive coordinator combination because yeah. it just seems like it's never going to end well, Wiz, because either that offensive coordinator sucks, you fire him, you're churning through that position, your quarterback yeah. doesn't get the continuity, or your offensive coordinator is incredible, and he just goes and gets a co head coaching job, right? And yeah. you keep that defensive head coach in, you keep cycling through offensive coordinators. We've seen that go bad, so just uh, not even something to action. Like I wouldn't say for anyone listening to put that in your tool belt, to bring him down a little bit. Um, but just, it's not bulletproof. You know what I'm saying? No, it's a fair point, Trev. I think that's why, you know, that's one of the reasons I am, you know, so high on Anthony Richardson. It's because we don't have to worry about, you know, his, his play caller, the guy that's going to grow him and everything like that go anywhere because he's his head coach. Right. So I think those scenarios where you have, you know, that offensive minded guy running the, running the show, I think that's even more of just like a, from a long-term perspective, just gives you a little bit more comfortability. Right. Yeah, man. Yeah. So I touched on my guy, Jaden Daniels there. And yep. we did talk about like, and it's funny because there's a couple of these guys at the top where we kind of talked about it already. And you know why? It's because we hit on their landing spot. I think yeah. um, the old Barry H for us is in order for uh, making some good calls last week with Scott. And we were a few weeks uh, early on some of the calls that came to fruition on the draft. So I uh, encourage anybody to go have a look. Uh, of course, landing spots are in. So some of the information has changed a little bit. But Jaden yeah. Daniels uh, settled in as my quarterback, too. I will say I didn't have him as my dynasty uh, rookie quarterback one. I think I might change that tune for 2024, Wiz. But we also, like, we didn't cover more weapons coming in to Washington, uh -huh. which yeah. is what happened, right? We saw yeah. Ben Sinat, one of our favorites over here at the Undroppables, go in the second round. And then Luke McCaffrey was a bit of a surprise at the end of the third. I think he was the last pick of the third round, um, but we know he's got that pedigree. Uh, I think um, I think Scott calls it the Nepo scale or something like, like that for nepotism <laughs> for the the kids of greats, right? Uh, sure. And the McCaffrey family was on there. So, um, what do you think the outlook is for Jaden Daniels in this offense with Terry Mack, with Dotson? And then with those running backs, along with Sinat as a nice little tight end prospect and Luke McCaffrey, who brings a different skill set. Yeah, look, it was real. like, I think one of the things that we liked going in, right, even just into the draft was that he's going to be going into a situation where he does have McLaurin and he does have Dotson, right? Like those were two of the things that we liked right off the bat. Adding somebody like, is it Sinat or Senate? Just, just so. I'm not sure. And I actually, like, I heard somebody on a podcast say Senate. And I don't know, like I actually internally yeah. have been calling him Benny the Sinner, Sinat. Um, <laughs> but then I also realized that if there's any like religious people or if he was religious, he might not yeah. necessarily appreciate that. So I don't know if I should use that one. Hit the comments if you think I should uh, continue Benny the Sinner, Sinat or Sinit. Either way, it still works. Um, no, but I think he was. So I'll go with Sinit. Um, He was my tight end too, right? So yeah. coming in, um, 
he was a guy that I liked. I think there's obviously I, you know, I hate doing this from year to year. Right. But if you're looking at a guy that did some of the things that like, you know, Sam Laporta did, why we loved him so much make makes guys miss after the catch, right. From a missed tackles force perspective, I think he was fourth, um, you know, in just 2023 out of all tight ends. So he really does some nice things. Um, and the thing is like, he's also a very good blocker. Right. So um, I think he's going to find his way on the field early and, awfully athletic for his size as well, Trav, which is another thing that I like. So just to see that second round draft capital for, you know, a guy that, you know, does make guys miss after the catch, which we have seen can be pretty like predictive for tight ends and fantasy success. I do like that. Um, you know, obviously they only had Zach Ertz kind of coming in there. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, with Cliff's kind of history with Zach Ertz, how long does, how long does it take for, for that to kind of switch over, right? Like, do we, does that come out of the gates? And it's really just, we're seeing a lot of Zach Ertz and sprinkling in somebody like Senate. Um, and what week does maybe that change occur? So we may have to be a little bit patient to start, but I think, you know, from a long-term perspective, getting an athletic guy like that, it, it, it is pretty exciting. And then, you know, if we touch on Luke real quick, um, yeah, pedigree, right? I think it was really cool to see them call Christian and they were, you know, they were like, Hey, your brother told us to draft you. And so seeing that stuff is always cool, but you know, he came in at, you know, about the 71st percentile in our model. I think that was a little surprising, uh, right? Converted QB to wide receiver. I just think he's a guy that's going to pick up the offense pretty quickly and wouldn't be surprised if he pushes his way into three wide receiver sets, you know, pretty early on in the season. Um, and he'll be a guy I'll be interested in to kind of look at his development because Terry McLaurin isn't getting any younger. And if we do see him pop a little bit, um, he could be part of the future as far as, you know, maybe somebody to target from a fantasy perspective, especially with that third round draft capital, right? Yeah, that third round draft capital is nothing to shake a stick at. And that tells me that he's going to get some looks for sure. You touched on a couple things. And the first one I want to talk about is relative to Ben Sinat, because I think everybody knows how I feel about Jaden Daniels. He is like right up there with Caleb Williams for me. And he's a borderline quarterback one for me in 2024. Uh, but Ben Sinat, we'll call it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the blocking, like you said, and not because I'm excited to watch him block, although that can be fun too. Um, I'm excited because that's what's going to keep him on the field. Zach Ertz yeah. does not do that. He is a target soaking pylon and I'm an Eagles fan. I can tell you that. Um, good hands, definitely, but his prime is long since passed. So I don't think the takeover is going to take too long because there's a lot more juice in Benny the Sinner. And so I just think he has that path to stay on the field. Um, we saw later in Cliff King, Kingsbury's tenure in Arizona that he was using the tight ends a little bit more in his offenses. So I think there's a nice little path. And I think part of that kind of holds true for um, McCaffrey as well, because Cliff Kingsbury likes to have a lot of wide receivers on the field, right? And Luke McCaffrey got that draft capital that dictates that he will be. Um, it'll be interesting interesting to see how the other pieces are used. I actually like was a big Deami Brown fan coming out, but he does a lot different things than does sure. Luke McCaffrey. He's an outside receiver. But what Luke McCaffrey does, I think like he is going to be a really nice fit in this offense. I think what he allows them to do is put Jahan Dotson a little bit more on the outside and have him operate in the slot. Uh, he played 70% slot snaps in college with Rice, and he was one of the best zone beaters in this draft class. Um, yeah. So I think I think two, two, uh, he hit two and a half yards per run against zone yep. each of the last two years at Rice, which was one of the better marks in the group of five. So. I love the fit in the offense. The only curiosity I have in this one is kind of links back to Sanat as well Is when we see Jaden Daniels scrambling around and getting free from the pocket, a lot of the times he's looking downfield or he's looking to run. And so I wonder how much that impacts those shorter targets, potentially maybe Luke McCaffrey, somebody who they have to draw up plays and make the first read a little bit more often just to get him some work. So that's my only smidgen of concern. And I definitely like some of these other wide receivers a lot more than Luke McCaffrey, but I did like the spot and I just hope with that offensive fit, it's also a fit with his new quarterback too. Yeah, it's a good point. And you know, what'll be interesting with them to see is because typically with what we see with these running quarterbacks, Trav, is them not really targeting the the running backs as much, right? Like taking, as you kind of said, is taking off going downfield. So, you know, do they try and keep him in the pocket a little bit more? And are those some of those shorter passes directed towards McCaffrey, or are they directed towards somebody like an Austin Eckler who's been a you know productive receiver in his own right in his career, right? So, 
seeing that split and seeing how they handle that, because obviously you don't want to rein Jaden Daniels into the point where he's not running at all. But I think, you know, they want to be somewhat cautious, cautious of it, especially, you know, those Washington fans have had an electric quarterback before, you know, in RG three. And I think you just, you want to enjoy them for longer than a little bit. Right. So. Yeah. I think those wounds might still uh, be being licked in certain places around Washington because yeah, there was a lot of promise there that hit a cliff very very fast okay Wiz, it's time it's time we're gonna get into the patriots in their draft obviously drake may at three we've got a lot of people just dogging the shit out of the patriots right now when those trade offers that they apparently received have been coming out um a lot of people you know i i don't know what to think about that necessarily like if you like your guy you like your guy and you stay in that spot yeah. um they also drafted Jalen Polk and Javon Baker. Jalen Polk was a surprise at the top of the second round. Javon yeah. Baker, um, they got in the fifth round, which we think is an absolute steal. I think it was the fifth, right? There's, we've been going through a fourth. lot of process. Fifth fourth. or the fourth? Yeah. Fourth for Javon, fourth. Javon Baker. Yeah, yeah. This, is a, this is a hefty show sheet just for a peek <laughs> behind the curtain. So we've been looking at a lot of prospects. But I like the moves. I am sometimes ever the optimist because I do like these players and I like to see good football and resurgence stories whiz, but I'm going to let you cook on this one. Okay. <laughs> this is where the group chat tilting happened. This was the centerpiece. Um, and so I just want you to let me know what you think about Dre May's insertion into the team, maybe his prospects to start which I think is the biggest question. And let me know what you think those wide receivers do for him as well as what he does for them. Yeah, absolutely. So I think to your point, if we just kind of start at the top, it seems like he was their guy, right? Um, so if they believe in him, they they think that's their guy. I do like the the upside more than with him as opposed to somebody like JJ. So, you know, I'm not saying JJ is going to be bad. I think JJ landed in a great spot. But, you know, as far as what they did with him, Trav, as far from a weapons perspective, I think I was a little bit critical at first just because, look, we trade. I'm a lad guy. I like him quite a bit. Um, so for them to trade out of 34 with the Chargers and have McConkey go at 34, that was a bit of a hit there, um, especially because, you know, who they ended up taking at 37 was Jalen Polk, right? So they both kind of profile as like a Z type receiver, right? The ability to go inside, kick into the slot when needed, but also, you know, win downfield a little bit as well. And I just thought between the two, if you're looking at, you know, which of those guys can do that role a little bit better, I would have maybe liked McConkey more there. Um but I think where you need to look at this thing is like the totality of it, right? So by trading down to 37 and grabbing a guy like Jalen Polk, look, who I do like. Um, and if I just pull this up here, came in from a model perspective, you know, came in in about the 62nd percentile, right? He's, And that's with, you know, being at a school with Roma Dunze, being at a school with Jalen McMillan, two other guys that, you know, one went top 10 and, and one went third round, right? So a um, lot of competition there and he was still kind of able to show out. And really when you look at kind of his profile, what he brings to the table, he's a tough guy, 6'1", 202, and seems like, you know, he can make some, you know, tough catches, not afraid to go over the middle. So seems like he's going to be one of those quarterback friendly targets in the beginning. Um, but again, where this kind of started to play out was by moving down to 37, we ended up swapping our fifth with a fourth. Right. And why is that important? Because later, when you look at where we took Javon Baker, we were able to take him as our second pick in the fourth round. Um, you know, I had some Troy Franklin dreams there to start the fourth round uh, on that third day. <laughs> and Denver quickly thwarted those, um, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But I think when you think about Javon Baker, he's true outside X receiver. Right. So now you're talking about the fit. Right. So you've got a guy that can kick in and out and polk. Um, you've got a true slot in Demario, and now you've got your your potential outside X of the future in Javon Baker, right? Super, uh, you know, aggressive route runner, um, is not afraid by any means, has shown physicality, so, you know, and has shown the ability to high point the ball, strong hands, and make some guys miss after the catch. So in theory, you've kind of, you've got at least the, the makings of a wide receiver room for the future for Drake May. I don't think by any means you can sit here and say, Trav, that this is the room that's going to get Drake to succeed. But I do think, you know, they have more talent or and more upside in the wide receiver room in New England than we've seen in quite some time. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right, right? They had uh, DeMario Douglas, who um, played well last year, but we obviously still have questions about his long term. We don't think he's going to be the type of guy to elevate that quarterback play. Kendrick Bourne, who has performed admirably, and I think is yeah. someone you shouldn't, you probably shouldn't sleep on him for 2024, to be honest, because he is that kind of deep threat, blow the top off guy, which I don't think any of these other three necessarily are. Um, but yeah, to your point, like Javon Baker, all of the stuff that you said and like how he operates around the boundary and his body control ability to keep the feet in. Uh, you yep. see some nice red zone work from him on some of his college tape as well. So I really like that. And then Polk, like I'm coming around to this pick in a big way, Wiz. It was a surprise yeah. pick, but we kind of talked about looking at the mocks before the draft and we kind of saw that Jalen Polk was valued higher by the NFL than we as fantasy nerds valued him anyway. And I yeah. think we maybe just didn't put as much stock into that as far as the draft capital he would get. And then you go back and look at him inside outside versatility, I think is really, really nice for him uh, because they kind of need that. He's got good hands, decent yep. after the catch, showed the ability to take a massive workload at Washington. So I like everything about this pick. And I think I might be a little bit higher than consensus on Jalen, uh, Jalen Polk when I'm done my rookie ranks for sure. It's, it's funny you say that too, Trav, because right there was the, I think it was a few days before the draft, maybe even two, where Peter Schrager, I think one of his latest mocks had him, had Polk going to the Chiefs at 32, right? So there was that buzz even outside of the Patriots that maybe potentially, you know, some other people saw him as a potential late first round guy. Um, and, you know, that's something, look, I just didn't see it at the time. But when you have guys like people like, you know, Matt Harmon said a lot of nice things about Polk on, uh, during their draft broadcast. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm coming around on the Polk pick as well after, you know, my McConkey scoring a little bit. But um, I'm excited for kind of how they fit together and looking forward to, you know, kind of seeing what that looks like. I The thing is, I don't know if we see them together, the three of them, right? If we're thinking about that nucleus um, mm -hmm. until a little bit more into the season, right? And, and I think I'm okay with that because I think I want them to make sure that Drake's ready when he comes in. Uh, I do want to see him play his rookie year, but, you know, I, I don't think we're in a rush here, right? You know, we've talked about before how the AFC is a gauntlet, AFC is a gauntlet. And so I just want to make sure that he's ready and, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be opposed to them waiting longer in the year. Yeah, no, totally. And like, if you look at it, obviously that kind of sucks for Drake May and drafting him, but I think long-term he is still going to be the cemented starter. Um, yeah. But I think playing with Jacoby Brissett early in the season, if either of these wide receivers are ready to start step into that starting role, say it is Jalen Polk, who's starting from day one with Jacoby Brissett, learns with a veteran quarterback, has the ability to support Drake May even further because he has some NFL games under his belt where he's been in the huddle been on the field with a veteran who knows how to run that huddle. And so I think that can only be a good support, right? Like these guys are going to have to grow together. Um, and yeah, we, I think we already saw Baker and Polk get together for a workout. Yeah, with, we did. Which you were fired yeah. up about that. You love to see those rookies take that initiative. And I think Jalen Polk's probably going to be a bit of a value in rookie drafts. Looking at the two that we did over the weekend, you were only yep. in one whiz, but one of them I did in like the middle of the seventh round. Cause I couldn't wait any longer. Um, the other one I did on Monday. Um, and in the first one I did, Jalen Polk went at 206. In the one that we did together on Monday, he went at the 2010 or 2, 2010. 210. He went at the 210. So I think that's extreme value for a guy who doesn't have a very muddy path towards being the top receiving option for an NFL team. And while that might not be the most efficient in the short term, compiling volume is still valuable for fantasy football. So great wrap on the Patriots. Um, you got another one you want to toss in there too? No, just going to say, I think this is going to be one of the teams from a camp perspective that we're going to have quite a bit of eyes on, right? You know, looking at the development of Drake throughout yeah. camp, but also looking at, you know, how Baker and Polk get up to speed. And then, you know, another guy that we'll talk about later is Jaheim Bell. So really interesting couple guys in camp for the Patriots. Yeah, I think Jaheim Bell could be a nice little taxi stash on those tight end premium teams. And yeah, talking about through camp, like what if Drake May just looks fucking awesome? That would be... I'm going to get sucked in, dude. I already, yeah, I already know totally. what's going to happen. I'm, I'm, I say, I, say I want off. him to sit now, and then we get to August. I'll probably be pushing for him to start. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. I love it. So, JJ McCarthy, we kind of nailed this this landing spot as well. It wasn't like a big secret or anything like that. Sure. JJ McCarthy yeah. to the Vikings was the most prevalent narrative going into the draft. Um, we love the landing spot, obviously. Kevin O'Connell, one of the best play callers and head coaches in the league. Uh, Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson. We got uh, Aaron, Jones Aaron Jones and yeah. um, Ty Chandler is there as well. So they have weapons. 
decent offensive line there as well. So it's a really good landing spot. But I still have a couple questions, Wiz. Like I just not having seen him hold up a lot of volume and keep an offense elite in college makes me wonder what his ultimate upside in the NFL is. Um, just the workload that's about to get dropped on JJ McCarthy is something that he's never seen before. And it's like, when we're looking at these guys, if he's, I know he is a little bit mobile and he can be frisky in the run game when needed, but I, I just have a hard time right off the bat saying that he's going to be a, put his team on the back 40 touchdown score, which is something that I look, look for in these guys who might not get that rushing to supplement. So what do you think about JJ McCarthy as the quarterback and maybe where his standing is with dynasty quarterbacks? You know what I mean? What's his ultimate ceiling say maybe in your dynasty ranks, do you think? Yeah. I, I mean, look, you, you really laid it out nicely with the fact that he really just landed in a, re, a fantasy friendly situation, right? Having JJ, having somebody like Jordan Addison, um, you know, TJ Hawkinson towards ACL in December, but you know, at some point he'll be back here. Right. And then obviously health providing you've got a dynamic pass catching back in Aaron Jones who we saw you know against the Cowboys in the playoffs has still got it when he's healthy right so when you think about the Minnesota Vikings um most pass attempts in the NFL last year right so Kevin O'Connell's not afraid to throw that ball and a lot of that Trav was without Kirk Cousins right you know we saw them really throw the ball with Josh Dobbs as much as they could and you know Nick Mullins came in there and threw it around as well so that's I think you brought up the point about McCarthy being able to support some volume here because we just haven't really seen it yet and I think that's going to be a, a fantastic thing to kind of monitor um I think we I think I do like him um, absolutely with the landing spot and everything like that. How long does it take for him to be able to support, you know, those kind of three options that are people are looking for or looking to for fantasy production, right? You know, you've got arguably the wide receiver one on the planet in JJ. Um, you've got a very good, especially, you know, in PPR and tight end premium formats in Hawkinson and then a former round one pick last year in Addison. Can a rookie quarterback support all three of those to the point where fantasy managers are happy with that? That's something where how long is that going to take to get up to speed um, from a dynasty rankings point, Trav? I think he's right around that 15, 16 area for me. Um, and one of the guys he's actually close to is Jared Goff. Right. And and that's kind of almost how I, you know, I think a good outcome for J.J. McCarthy would be like, you know, Jared Goff is like not a bad career. If you look at Jared Goff, what he's done, he's gone to the Super Bowl. He landed in the right system with Ben Johnson, and, and he's been very fruitful there for not only his fantasy value, but the fantasy value for others around him, right? So if he could be an elevated version of a Jared Goff or, you know, and that's being kind as far as, you know, ceiling and stuff like that. But if, if he could even be that, Trav, that's a nice win. No, I think that is a nice win. And I'm right in the same neighborhood. Like I have McCarthy at 17, just yep. behind like Trevor Lawrence, Brock Purdy. Uh, I have a big tier of rookies, actually McCarthy um, and then Bo Nix and Drake Mayer, not too far behind. And then Bryce Young, Kirk Cousins type area. Jared Goff's right there as well. So I think that's really well put with his standing because there is room for him to move upward, I think is what you're saying sure. on that ranking. So really, yeah. And he's got the play caller to help him do it, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that's really well said. Um, okay. Looking at the next ones, Bo Nix goes to Denver. We yep. called this one. We thought it was going to happen. I think my favorite of my draft calls was that all four of these, or sorry, all six of these quarterbacks were going to be gone by the 16th pick. I don't know if we expected them all to be gone by the 12th pick whiz, and we'll talk <laughs> about that in just a second. But the, the guy who kind of brought up that rear was Bo Nix. Uh, I think it's a good fit with Sean Payton. We talked about this. Sean Payton has shown offenses that can dink and dunk a little bit. And we think that's mm -hmm. the best path to success for Bo Nix. Uh, biggest question for him most likely is what's the ceiling with maybe some questions about his downfield passing. I think a boon to that is that they also brought in a wide receiver that we've seen him do some downfield passing with, and yep. that is Troy Franklin in the fourth round. This was a big, Big surprise for us that Troy Franklin fell that far into the fourth. We had him as borderline first round wide receiver here at the undroppables. And a lot of other people had him getting no further past like top half of the second round. Yeah. But that was a big slide. And I think for me, it definitely impacts my perception of him. Uh, yeah. I know you're still bullish whiz. And I know that he went at the 202 still in that rookie mock that we were talking about. So why don't you add any additions that you have to Bo Nix, but I think the meat and potatoes here is Troy Franklin's outlook, right? Sure. Yeah. So I do think that 
it, from the rookie drafts that I've been in so far, I mean, dude, there's been times where I've seen Bo Nix slide to like 205 and I'm wow. not the biggest Bo Nix guy, but like that to me is like egregious, right? Like yeah. he's, oh, he's yeah. a top 12 pick in a Sean Payton offense that is probably going to start right away. He's, you know, he was just in college for five years. It's not like he needs to be seasoned anymore. And that to me, like just that, that feels like way too long. Right. So if he's going anywhere in, near that in your drafts, I think, even if he gets to like 204 or something like that, start testing the waters and trying to trade up because I think that's just immediate value right there, whether you love him or not. Um, but yeah, look, I think he's a fit for probably what Sean Payton wants to do. Well, I don't think he necessarily has the ceiling of, of somebody like we just talked about in a JJ McCarthy. Um, and I don't you know, obviously he doesn't have the weapons there right now to support that either right now. Right. I think he's got, you know, some analytical darlings in, in, you know, Marvin Mims and now a guy like Troy Franklin. Um, we'll see what happens with Cortland Sutton and if he's part of their long-term plans there, Trav. Uh, I think what would be really big for Bo Nix is, is if we could see a guy like um, Greg Dolchitz come back and, and really kind of make an impact for them, right? Having that athletic tight end would be something that would be a boon for them. But if we're talking about Franklin here, um, I think – I think you mentioned 202 it's probably a bit early for me um Same. at that point right just because i think there's some other guys on the board there that you know better draft capital probably and there's a reason why he fell a little bit and i think largely it's size concerns i think it surprised a lot of people to your point though trav you know when you look at a lot of people that were kind of on twitter that night um and even kind of that next day a lot of people really didn't have him past that you know 50 that mid second round you know maybe into the 60s or something like that so so but i do think he had a soft landing spot right you look at the fact that he landed with his college qb they've already kind of got that rapport downfield that we saw at oregon um so i think that is a nice benefit to you know if you're trying to be optimistic about troy franklin i think if you're looking at what's happening in rookie drafts right now trav i think that's probably what's driving some of the optimism for Troy Franklin, right? I think obviously his analytical profile was, you know, one of the more sterling ones in the class, but if he hadn't landed with somebody else other than his college quarterback in that fourth round, I don't necessarily know if we're seeing that same sort of steam right now. So I am still optimistic on, you know, Troy, Troy Franklin being able to return on that fourth round draft capital, but I'm not, I'm, I still am a little bit wary of where he's currently going in rookie drafts. So I've, to, for me to build, feel a little bit more comfortable, I kind of wish he was going a little bit later. Yeah, in that Jalen Polk range that I was talking about, like that yeah. 210 area, right? I think that's spot on. With like two top of the second is a little bit steep for me for a fourth round wide receiver because these guys don't hit a ton, right? You're not getting too many hits out of the fourth round as far as stud wide receivers. I think Troy Franklin, like you said, the analytical profile says that he could be one of the guys to do it. And mm -hmm. that analytical profile is so good that despite that fourth round draft capital, I'm not sure the exact percentile, but he is still up there in our model for 2024 draft class. So I think that just speaks to what he did in college. Um, and I think that's why we might have some of that optimism still around him. And I think what he does for Bo Nix is like, I don't think we have any illusions that Bo Nix is going to be here putting up quarterback one seasons year over year um, but Troy Frank Franklin might help him towards doing that and despite some of the kind of arm strength stuff we've seen quarterbacks such as Drew Brees now I'm not saying Bo Nix is Drew Brees yeah. but Drew Brees towards the end of his career had to alter his play style because his arm wa wasn't what it once was so I think Sean Payton's just kind of been there done that and he can tailor the offense around Bo Nix and hopefully that includes Troy Franklin, because yeah, just a dynasty depth stash for me right now, which probably takes him off my table at that price. But if he slides back, I'm a lot more interested because I think he could develop into like a useful wide receiver three for fantasy rosters. Um, yep. And that doesn't sound like much, but for a fourth round wide receiver, that's about all you can hope for. Uh, yeah. So I think that's pretty solid and the upside to burn on top of that. Obviously, he's, he is a guy that can make big plays and separate. We just got to see it and we just got to see what kind of runway he has to be able to blossom into that yeah i think one of the biggest things trav would be if they move on from Cortland sutton and really you know try and lean into some of the youth that they have there with marvin mims and troy franklin and you know pending greg dolchich's health or something like that that's that's a situation that franklin would probably get a bit more enticing yeah i would say with the draft capital and with the outlook right now we definitely still have a candle burning for troy franklin but if Cortland yep. sutton were to leave town we're gonna burn this motherfucker down is what we're yeah. gonna do is uh because i think that would be like huge boost that's where 202 is yes please i'll take them yeah absolutely. Um, 
The next guy we're going to talk about, I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to give the listeners a little peek behind the fourth yeah. wall here, Wiz, because he's not even on your show sheet. Um, and so just to, to give everybody a glimpse into some of our process, Wiz and I like to make sure that this show is produced as best as we can for you. We'd like to meet at least once before the show, just kind of talk about the flow, talk about how we're going to direct traffic a little bit. Yep. And through all of that, kind of fitting, in fact, Michael Penix wasn't even on the show sheet, Was Totally forgot to even put him on there. We talked through all of these topics. Yeah. Didn't even think to bring his ass on there. Um, man. When, you, like, when think... you messaged me that earlier and was like, uh, hey, I forgot Penix on the show sheet. I was like, that couldn't be like more appropriate. Like, yeah. It was because it's gonna he we're gonna forget about him by the time that he starts. By the time that he starts, he's gonna be as old as I am right now, basically. So um what do you think about that pick and like what do you think that does for Penix? Because we're seeing him as a top 10 quarterback go in like the I middle know. of rookie drafts right now. And I think there's definitely some value there, but you just if you're in dire need for a quarterback, I would be trying to make the trade up play for one of these other guys, as opposed to waiting for Michael Penix. Cause I think it could be a couple of years or a Kirk cousin injury before we see anything from him. Uh, so a bit of a bummer, but let me know what you thought about the pick. Like what was your reaction when they did it? Um, and then what do you think kind of the, um, the fallout is? I thought it was honestly, I thought I was reading it wrong. You know, when I'd seen, I was trying to avoid my phone as much as I could during that first round. So I wasn't, so I was still kind of like surprised. Um, but I had seen some stuff come through just because like, you know, Twitter became a blaze when it, when it got known and I just, you know, sorry, Falcons fans, but I just really couldn't believe it. Um, you know, you go at, you go out and sign somebody like Kirk cousins that, you know, hundred million guaranteed 180 million total. If he plays through those four years and it's like, that to me signals win now. And then you go, you know, spend the eighth pick on a quarterback that's 24 years old and is going to sit for two to three years. It's, so it just didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, you know, from a di or from a fantasy perspective, Trav, it's tough, right? Because like, yeah, he he's a top 10 pick. Um, and, but you, you pretty much know that he's not going to be starting for at least a couple of years. And, and then when he does start, he's going to be, you know, 26, 27 years old, barring an injury from Kirk. So, Look, I, I think it it does get to a point where maybe in that kind of second round, that maybe towards that middle of it, two five, two six, two four area, where if if you're at a luxury where your dynasty team is kind of set, um, if you've got somebody else's pick and maybe you, you know, have it have your pick at the end of the second and you just want to take a luxury pick to stash Michael Penix, yeah, sure, go ahead. But I, I can't really say he'll be a guy that I'll be targeting. I think my plan on him would be all right, have somebody else take them. And then maybe they get frustrated with, you know, after six, eight games saying, all right, like it, this just, he's not going to play for another two years. And maybe you check in and w then and see if like the price is down or depressed or a little bit like that. Um, for now, there's, there's some more enticing options that could kind of help you now from a dynasty perspective where it just seems like he's quite blocked for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's not looking great. And it's, uh, I heard a, I was listening to a podcast today and I heard a take like, okay, well maybe they just kind of thought that with Kirk cousins in town, they're going to be a Super Bowl contender. Anyway, they're going to have that lower pick and it'll be a while before they get another one. So they'll just go for them. Now. I think it's that just is just weird. the biggest load of bullshit. It man. is. If, if, it if is. you are a Super Bowl team right now, take somebody that's going to help you right now. Like Roma Dunze was sitting right fucking there. And if yeah. you want Kirk cousins to be the focal point of your championship run you give them romo dunze you know what i mean, I mean or like even brock bowers or something like i guess they have kyle pitts sorry i was just thinking of pass catchers there but yeah no that would have been imagine incredible. how different things would be today if they had taken like roma dunze and caleb williams didn't have him and you know i saw ryan pole saying yeah when we saw that he took Penix or they took Penix, you know they were thrilled because they just didn't think that odunze was going to be there at nine yeah no brainer absolute no brainer so then we see brock bowers go to the raiders you know what's mm. funny was also forgotten on this sheet fucking the two biggest wide receivers on marvin harrison and malik neighbors oh yeah so i was probably super high when i made this show or something like that because how do i forget those guys <laughs> but do you want to uh do you want to give uh just so many peeks behind the curtains on this episode we're just giving <laughs> you guys glimpses into who we are um hope you like that about us because that's just you know it's on our sleeve um, yeah. um so i think it's pretty safe to say Mar marvin harrison jr like locked in probably borderline top 12 wide receiver from the yeah. jump um anything you want to add to that Wiz? 
No, I, th I think it's been said at nauseum at this point, but super like just fantastic landing spot is going to be, you know, target one a out of the gate with Kyler. I don't know if we're in for like a Jamar chase type season um, because it's just really hard to project like a, you know, historical rookie season, but you know, he really couldn't have landed in like a better situation. So I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see something like, you know, maybe like 1100, maybe flirting with like 1200 yards and, you know, maybe seven, eight touchdowns. I think, if he does that um, and we see that he's attached to Kyler for the future, I think, you know, he's Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to smash. That's that's my analysis. <laughs> yeah. Signed, <laughs> sealed, delivered. I don't yeah. think we have to go much further on that. But to your point, I think you're being a little bit conservative on that projection because that Jamar Chase season, I think, is in his realm of possibilities. Yeah, but you're right. We would never like come out here and put our stamp on the fact that he's going to have one of the best rookie seasons ever. Sure. Um, how about Malik? Different story in New York. Uh, Mr. Barrett was happy. I was sad just because I'm still going to love him from fantasy, but from yeah. a real football perspective, I just kind of have to hate Malik neighbors now that he's on the New York giants. And I hope New York giants fans could respect that because <laughs> if the shoe was on the other foot, I would expect them to hate that person going to the Eagles as well. So why don't you talk like, Hyper targeted is what we expect from Malik neighbors, yep. the ability to be quarterback proof, which is kind of primo considering the landing spot that he had. Feel free to tack onto that Wiz. We talked about it with Barrett, man. Um, and one of the things that we said was if he lands in New York, he's option again, he, both these guys landed in option one, a right. Whereas like, they're going to be the guy. And whereas you look at somebody like Roma Dunze, um, he's obviously going to be competing heavily for those targets. These guys are going to be targeted right out of the gate. I think even with subpar quarterback play that we can probably expect there in New York, he's just going to be a target machine. I would be surprised if he didn't at least have, you know, like 120, maybe even upwards of that from a target perspective. So I think for PPR, like I wouldn't be surprised to see something like, and maybe this isn't what people want to hear, but you know, Garrett Wilson last year dealt with bad quarterback play his, his rookie year as well. Um, but was just targeted at an absurd rate. So I think what you're hoping for in those first, you know, what couple years or two, we'll see what how this kind of year plays out for them with the QB and Daniel Jones and everything. But I think one thing you can't expect with Malik Neighbors in New York is he's going to be targeted early and often. And I think that's going to give him a decently high floor. And if we see Daniel Jones, you know, return to anything kind of we saw like the year before uh, when that offensive line wasn't a disaster, maybe there's even a little bit more upside there from Malik. But I, I still, you know, while it doesn't look good on the surface, Trav, I still overall for his fantasy outlook, I'm not too, too worried. Yeah, exactly. Everything you said, the fact that his upside, a lot of it is just baked into the way that he wins and the way that he produces. Um, I'm in a best ball draft on underdog right now, and I just want to get some quick underdog ADP. So I was looking at my dynasty rankings and I haven't done wide receivers yet, but both of these guys are going to be firmly in my top 12 Marvin Harrison bordering on top five. Um, not sure if I'm going to get him there, but he's going to be damn close. And in this underdog draft that I just did, uh, Marvin Harrison went as the, as the 17th overall pick fifth pick wow. in the second round. Malik neighbors came. Oh, I don't know if he's gone yet. So we're at pick 25. Malik neighbors is not off the board, um, but he's tops in the ADP with an ADP of pick 25. So first pick of the third round. So these guys are getting steamed even in early best ball drafts. Um, but I think that's fair because um, yeah, lots of targets coming efficiency to burn on top of it. Very nice so the one that i was going to go to was before i figured out my uh little faux pas on forgetting some elite prospects on our draft roundup show sheet <laughs> was brock bowers and uh going to the raiders at 13 the raiders missed out on the quarterback atlanta pulled the wool over their head taking michael Penix at eight i've seen reports saying that the raiders confirmed that they were going to take michael Penix at 13 if he was there um, considering the quarterback play that they might see this year, what do you think about Bowers ultimate upside? Like, I think it's safe to say that versus Cincinnati versus the Colts and some of the other landing spots we gave him, this one was a little bit saddening, but do you think it's that bad Wiz? Well, it certainly like is a devastating blow to my Michael Mayer dynasty shares. I'll tell you that mm -hmm. much. So we can go ahead and pour one out for those right now. Um, now look, I think he is a guy Trav that he's 
like a unicorn, man. So I, I do think the landing spot, I don't want to say it's being overblown, but like, I do think there's still like a world here where Brock Bowers is like largely going to be like, all right. Um, I'm more curious to see like what the offense looks like, right? Like, are we going to be looking at a lot of 12 personnel with something like that? Um, or is this going to be something where, you know, they almost use Bowers in, in this offensive kind of weapon sort of thing, right? Where you, you know, you see him, almost acting as like a bigger wide receiver, like a Travis Kelsey sort of thing. Right. Um, and that's in kind of saw it a little bit with Dalton Kincaid last year as well. So that's kind of where I lean, but you know, the camp battle for QB will be also interesting to play out. Um, right now, I think I lean that it might be Gardner Minshew. Um, but that's going to be a storyline to kind of monitor throughout camp. So look, I, I don't, it's obviously not to your point. It's not the Colts. It's not, you know, one of those better landing spots, but He's a guy from a dynasty perspective. I think he's definitely taken a little bit of a hit. Um, and this is something I'll be talking about in the upcoming days here. But from a dynasty perspective, I would still be looking to see if you can capitalize on the name there. Um, and, you know, can you take somebody who still loves that Brock Bowers pedigree and go look to maybe a more established veteran tight end and maybe get a plus on top of it, right? Like that's that's how I would kind of look at it. Because like if you look at some of the best tight end prospects that have come out over the past couple of years, Trav, they've got two of them now. So, you know, is this, is this a new Gronk Hernandez situation where you've got, you know, somebody like Mayer who is kind of more that seam tight end, big blocker, stuff like that. And you've got Hernandez or you've got Bowers operating in like a souped up Hernandez role. I don't know. Um, but look, I think he's still going to be useful. I think it definitely is a small hit to his, you know, near term kind of production outlook and dynasty outlook. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it definitely is. And I think it's not necessarily a hit from him being even a tight end one, maybe even like a top seven tight end. But I think yeah. it's a hit from him being the tight end one. You know what I mean? That's where I see it. I'm still super excited about Brock Bowers. I have a uh, rookie draft that started today. I was at the 110. He was available at the 108 wow. and I need a tight end. Um, mm -hmm. And so I tried to make I tried to go up and get him. Um, by adding my third to my 110 to get it, the person logged on and picked because they were they felt bad that they had taken up some clock, but then messaged me and said, "Shit, I would have taken that." So I said, "Hey, that's still on the table, and my 110's not up for another pick." So you let me know. So, like, I am still very bullish on him for that fact because, yeah, I think uh, much like neighbors, a lot of that stuff is baked in, um, and and I think he's just going to be able to do it after the catch, despite whichever of these quarterbacks. Like Gardner Minshew has been a good short passing quarterback before and i think that's a good way to insulate some of the shortcomings of both of these guys is to allow them to get some dump offs to brock bowers and let him do some stuff on his own i like sure. exactly what you said about michael mayer i think we're going to see a lot more two tight end sets this year last yep. year they didn't throw that many pass attempts out of 12 personnel so that could change it is a new offensive coordinator albeit the same head coach uh, but yep. when we look on the dynasty spectrum Wiz, i want to ask you brock bowers or okay Yep. Um, we're going to start, I think maybe a little bit soft Brock Bowers or Mark Andrews for dynasty. I'll still take powers. Same. What about TJ Hawkinson? I'll take Hawkinson. Really? Hey, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that one's very close and now I can't even remember because it's so close, but I have, Bowers just above Hawkinson. So I think you probably have him in like that six, seven. I think I have him yep. in that five, six, you know what I mean? Yep. So right in the yep. same neighborhood, just one of these young, hungry tight ends that's coming into the landscape. And maybe just maybe Wiz, this is finally the year where we get a plethora of productive tight ends, but we know. I think we, we started that. to see it last year, man. Like the tight end position so isn't the desolate kind of landscape that it was we definitely saw like that reinvigoration a little bit last year with those younger guys like Laporta and McBride um it'll be really nice if we can get Pitts going this year get my guy Jelani Woods going in Indianapolis <laughs> I'm just kidding but um you mean Kylan Granson stop um, my <laughs> no. candles lit for Jelani and only Jelani so are you the only one who's allowed to have a fucking candle lit with I'm not allowed to have a fucking candle lit here I'm blowing your I'm blowing your Kylan Granson candle out. Wow. It's really <laughs> dark in here. I'm scared. <laughs> that was the only light that I had was um <laughs> yeah, I think the problem with that is just that we've been saying that this could be the year that tight end is desirable back yeah. since Mark Andrews was drafted, probably. So it's almost like we're crying wolf now that it's actually happening. <laughs> yeah, I know. So people aren't gonna believe us, but 
Okay, looking at the back of the first. So I realized just for our listeners that we're creeping up on the hour mark, but I said at the top, this one is going to be thick, potentially with three C's. So thank you for staying dialed in with us. we got a bunch more stuff to talk about. This episode might be a little more of a marathon than it is a sprint, but we will get to that finish line. And personally, I just think that a lot of this stuff is really worth talking about. And in the in the sentiment of laying a nice groundwork for you, our listener, I think this is the best way for us to do it. So thanks again. Subscribe to that channel. Please make sure you're following the Undroppables on social media. Check out the Patreon. You can get a little bit off the top of the UN score, which just dropped today. Day. Uh, really excited about everything that's happening. So thanks for sticking around and uh, keep riding with us. Keep riding with us. So Wiz, we're going to look at the back of the first wide receivers. Yep. The first couple were a little bit on the chalky side. The last two were absolutely not. Brian <laughs> Thomas Jr. goes at pick 23 to the Jaguars after they traded back from 17, which I think was a great move by them. Xavier Worthy was taken at pick 28 after the Chiefs traded up with the Bills from pick 32. And then we saw Ricky Pearsall jump all the way up into the first round and get taken yeah. at 31 by the San Francisco 49ers. And then even more surprising than that, um, I think, well, when okay, I was on the stream with you guys, the draft stream when this happened, and I had just hopped on because I was coming in to kind of ride it out. Uh, yeah. the, the Panthers trade up and we're all sitting there on the stream. It's Leggett. Oh my God, it's Leggett. I was like, it would be it's awesome Leggett. if it was Leggett. Yeah. Yeah. And then it happened and we all just lost it. That kind of shit is electric to be on yeah, the live stream for that live reaction stuff. So much fun. So they traded up from 33 to 32 to come and get Xavier Leggett. Um, first off, these four guys, BTJ, Worthy, Pearsall, and Leggett. Why don't you just rank those four for me from a dynasty perspective, Wiz, and then we're going to unravel them. Yeah, I'll go Worthy, BTJ, Pearsall, Leggett. Yeah, I think that's where I'm sitting as well. And I think some of it is the offensive attachment for Worthy and Pearsall. Um, Pearsall with San Francisco, we know that's a nice offense. And that's why he kind of stays in that realm. And then Worthy with Kansas City and the Chiefs. I think that's how I would rank them as well. So let's start with Xavier Worthy. I think of these wide receivers, aside from those top three that were drafted, maybe even more so than Romo Dunze, he has one of the most clear paths to early useful fantasy production with Kansas City. Rashi Rice is probably looking at maybe a couple of game suspension, if not a couple yeah. more. I was listening to a pod today saying that that's kind of shifted from like the zero to three to maybe like the two to four area. So I think that's realistically potentially going to happen. And so Xavier Worthy on the opposite side of Hollywood Brown with Travis Kelsey in the middle and Patrick Mahomes slinging it. Um what are you expecting from Xavier Worthy in year one? Um, and are you still bullish from a dynasty perspective as well? Yeah, look, I still am bullish from a dynasty perspective. Um, I think I've got him. I'm just looking here, Trav, just to give you an idea. I've got him in that wide receiver three range right now. And the only reason why I say that is because, look, I do think he landed in a great spot with a, you know, from an offensive coordinator or, you know, from an offensive coach perspective with somebody like Andy Reid, um, who's just one of the most creative play minds that we have. And the thing that I would love to see with Worthy is really what we've seen come out of Miami, um, as well as what we saw with, you know, Puka last year in San Francisco, or sorry, in LA with Sean McVay was utilizing some of that motion pre-snap, right? Getting him moving, getting him in those, you know, advantageous situations against safeties and linebackers that are really not going to be able to keep up with somebody like him and his 4-2 speed. Um, still sounds crazy to say 4-2, but um, <laughs> it's just like, almost, I always feel like I'm flat. <laughs> Yeah, I just like I'll, I feel like I'm misspeaking. Um, but look, I do have like some target concerns there, right? Just because, yes, I think maybe in the early part of the season um, with Rasheed Rice going to be probably suspended anywhere from looks like four to six games or something like that. So maybe you see some early on production there, but Rasheed's going to be a part of that offense when, when he gets back, right? So, you know, thinking about somebody like Travis, who's still going to be involved, uh, thinking about somebody like Rasheed, thinking about somebody like Hollywood, um, I, I do have a tough time like getting him over like, you know, 80, 90 targets. And if that's the case, um, that's where I just kind of look at his ceiling, maybe capped that kind of rookie season. I think he's going to be a fun best ball player this year, though, because there's probably going to be some big play activity out of him. Um, but yeah, from what what you're hoping for from a dynasty perspective, Trav, is 
is Kelsey starts to take on less of a load. And also maybe Hollywood Brown's deal is only one year and they bring in like a lesser receiver who's earning somebody maybe less targets like that, right? And maybe not as redundant as somebody like Worthy. But look, from a creative perspective, love the landing spot for him. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I'm looking at my rankings right now. While I don't have the rookies inserted, I think he would be right in that back end of the top 36 for me, kind of in the yeah. probably on the top end of the kind of Calvin Ridley, Chris Godwin, Terry McLaurin, Cortland Sutton area, mm -hmm. because his movement is probably looking like it would go upwards in the dynasty rankings, where some of those guys probably are more likely to move down in the dynasty rankings. And so, yeah, I think that's a really good eval because there is some upside to burn on top of that. And I think what's making it kind of hard for me to figure out how the usage is going to go is that all of these guys can operate both from the slot or from outside exactly. obviously Travis Kelsey kicks out to the slot from time to time as well so it's really hard to see how they're all going to be used uh, I would think maybe Worthy and Hollywood on the outside for the majority of it with Rashi Rice manning some slot like he did at I the would end imagine of last that year too. yep but then if they're in heavier sets and they have less wide receivers on the field what does that look like right who are the guys that they prioritize I would think Rashi Rice being a little bigger body than those other two might be one of those guys for blocking situations but time will tell the beauty of it is that all of these guys are good from each of those areas like xavier worthy was super efficient on less volume from the slot in college and if we look at his work on the outside even as a smaller receiver majority of his production did come from lining up on the outside so yep yeah i think things are looking up for xavier worthy why don't we talk about btj because we had some really good conversation about him and he was our second in this group of four from the first round. Um, I think, I know he wasn't yours, but consensus, he was the wide receiver for Brian Thomas Jr. And he was drafted as such by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, I think I might be um, a little bit more in on him than you are. I know that some of you guys from the team were not stoked about this landing spot. And I think that's probably the most um, prevalent um, perception of this move. So maybe I'm glass half full as opposed to glass half empty, but why don't you tell me what your reservations are on Brian Thomas, even though we had a nice evaluation on him going into the draft, the landing spot made you feel different with why I will say his landing spot got a little bit better today. Um, you know, Zay Jones is no longer that's with the right. Jaguars as of today. Right. So, and, and say what you want about Zay Jones, but you know, that's probably, six, yes, <laughs> that's probably 60, 70 targets going out the door. Right. So that's, that's a start. Um, one of the things that I just thought about from a BTJ perspective was, look, I, I think he, the, you can see the upside case for a guy like him clearly, you know, size, speed, freak, everything like that. Um, but you know, they did sign Gabe Davis. They did, they do have, you know, Evan Ingram there is coming off a 140 target season. And, you know, I probably like Christian Kirk maybe more than the average guy, but I think he was a really important part of, in productive part of that offense last year, right? Like Trevor Lawrence really did kind of lean on him quite a bit when he was in the lineup. So, you know, those are three guys that I would expect to have, you know, at probably a hundred targets each, right? So now you're thinking about, okay, are they, they're going to four guys over a hundred targets. And that's where maybe just tempering expectations that first year, um, you know, if you're going to have that guy, that many guys have a hundred targets, uh, that that production is going to be spread around quite a bit. So look, I, I think there's potential for boom weeks with a guy like Brian Thomas and, you know, a bigger armed quarterback like Trevor Lawrence. Um, but it'll just be really interesting to see how he fits into a Doug Peterson offense that, you know, has relied on tight ends quite a bit in the past. We've seen how heavily they've targeted Evan Ingram. Um, and you know, is he just strictly going to be an outside guy, right? Or is that what they're going to use Gabe Davis for? And maybe they're more inclined to use him a little bit more over the middle than we might have thought so i i like the landing spot more than i did draft night trap but i still have reservations about overall volume no that's completely fair i think my stance for these guys whiz is that if they all get a flat 100 targets i'm putting my bet on brian thomas jr to have the most upside on those 100 targets right just with his size with his speed a lot of people are kind of linking him to Calvin Ridley's role. And I see that because Calvin Ridley was used as the downfield target. But I've always kind of thought that Calvin Ridley was miscast as a downfield target. I thought he was a lot better, especially in his Atlanta kind of blow up seasons as that slot target soaker does a little bit of work after the catch, not necessarily going downfield, running wind sprints all the time, but that's how he's kind of been used. And I think some of that is similar with Christian Kirk as to how he's been used in his tenure in uh, Jacksonville after Arizona is I think he profiles better as a volume eating slot player as opposed to a downfield player as well. So yep. 
I just think for me, I think the role for Brian Thomas Jr. is more secure than you might let on. Like I think Christian Kirk definitely kicks into the slot. Gabe Davis does stay on the outside with Brian Thomas being on the outside. They're going to run some 12 or some 11 personnel. And I think if one of Gabe Davis and Brian Thomas Jr. are on the field, if not Brian Ch Thomas Jr. from game one, it won't be very long before he gets there. And so, yeah, we can project him into that Calvin Ridley role. But with what I said about Calvin Ridley being more of a slot guy and Brian Thomas to me being more of a pure outside guy, I think ceiling for Brian Thomas is probably higher than we saw from Calvin Ridley, especially if those targets come for BTJ. So, um, yeah, what do you think? Was like out of these three wide receivers, keep Evan Ingram out of it because I think he is going to be heavily targeted, but I do think he only mm -hmm. has room to go down from the 140 that he had last year. Um, yeah, that's how, fa how far down and how impactful is that to a boost for the other guys? I don't know, but of those three wide receivers, who would you say that you would put your money on finishing as a top 15 wide receiver in 2024? Oh God, as a top 15, um, Let's say yeah, we can go top 18 if you want a top 20. I mean, look, if we phrase it like this, who do I think is going to score the most fantasy points for, out of out of that trio? I think it's Christian Kirk. That's fair. That's fair. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily fair, and I definitely don't agree. I think it could be Brian <laughs> Thomas Jr. Um, yep. I could even see Gabe Davis outscoring Christian Kirk, but I might just be a bit of a Christian Kirk hater if we're being yeah. honest. Um, but what I see is that the past two years with Jacksonville, like we look at some of the stats for Christian Kirk, only six top 15 weeks. And in 2022, he was only competing with Zay Jones, who, while I love, is not a world beater. Um, and some other just kind of nobody's in that wide receiver room. So... Yeah, I don't know. And I think he was even more inconsistent in his time with Arizona. So maybe I'm just a little bit a bit sour on that. But I don't know. I Even last year, I was saying that Zay Jones is going to outproduce Christian Kirk. So I don't know if that's an indictment on my feelings towards Zay or my feelings towards Kirk, let's <laughs> yeah. say. Um, but I still think it's BTJ. And I just think that there might not be enough credit given to the fact that he can come in here and he can take over that job, not just be given that job. You know what I mean? I think oh, he has fair. some profile to do that, especially if, we, if he starts hitting pay dirt with his big body in the red zone, I think that could look really nice. We saw Travis Etienne take like a bunch of carries last year as well. One of them, I think he had the most carries in the league, which is wild yeah. for a running back of his stature. So I don't know. I can see that offense shifting a little bit with the insertion of the T J Pearsall and Leggett Wiz, which one, like which one do you want to wax on? Basically tell me about, tell, tell so, me about like it gun in my head. It, obviously these are two guys with analytical profiles that leave a ton to be desired. Right. And that's why, you know, when you look at what they, where they kind of um, landed in the model, that's, that's why they are where they are, right? There's no film kind of element in the model or anything like that. So for anybody checking out the model and wondering why they're lower, it's because their analytical profiles are kind of dog shit, right? They, for the lack of a better word, they really are. I think if you're looking at the upside case for both of these guys and what does that look like? I guess, give me the guy that's tied to somebody like Kyle Shanahan. Um, you know, we do see potentially some uncertainty going on with what the wide receiver room looks like in San Francisco going forward. I think, I think that's being kind of overblown this year. I don't necessarily know if we're going to see either one of them move. Like the, the 49ers are in a Super Bowl window right now. I, I think it would be crazy of them to say, hey, we're going to move one of these guys and we're just going to roll with these rookies. So look, I, I think this kind of this rookie year for Pearsall is going to be trying to get integrated, learn the offense so that like when one of these guys does, or if one of these guys does the part in the off season, and for the record, I think it's probably going to be Debo um, is Pearsall kind of able to slide into not the Debo role, but a Debo like role going forward. So look, I'll take the guy that's attached to one of the better play callers that we've seen about getting his guys in space. Um, Leggett, we saw Canales kind of talk about him, right? I think he's talked about jet sweeps. He talked about a, a number of things he did at South Carolina. Look, size speed freak. You can you can see why some people are like, hey, if he puts it all together, okay, sure. Um, the thing is right off the bat, he's not out targeting Deontay Johnson. Uh, they did take Jatavian Sanders as well in the fourth round. So I would be, I, I just, I definitely have some volume concerns there and how efficient can he be on those? So like, that's a guy that like, the thing is, Trev, I think, Pull up those mocks, but I've seen him go anywhere from, you know, like 110 or 111 in one all the way down to like 210 in another. So you can just see how the community right now is like kind of split on him. Yeah. So he went as the 211 in the first draft that we did. And in the second one, he went as the 208. So you're getting him at the back of the second. And like, 
when I see Ricky Pearsall right behind him at 209, Jalen Polk at 210, even Roman Wilson at 211, I get a little bit of pause on that. But I will say I have been feeling maybe a little bit more optimistic about Xavier Leggett in like, and a part of it is the presence of Deontay Johnson. Like Leggett's not going to have to come in here and be a 140 target guy from the get. So I think mm -hmm. he does have some of that time to develop. And there's lots of questions. Like I think Joe was mentioning that he thinks that he should be a slot and definitely not an outside. Um, I kind of see it a little bit different. Like when I was kind of, I went back and watched a little Xavier Leggett and I don't have some trained scout eye or anything, but I was seeing him get kind of washed out on some of those short crossers across the field where he just kind of gets lost in a pile of bodies and you yeah. see him going deep down the field and it looks like he can be pretty good not necessarily at separating but boxing out with that big frame because he doesn't separate you know what i mean uh, which yeah. is something that might be a downfall of one of the second round round wide receivers that we talk about here but not like necessarily saying steam will get up any further than that draft cost we were just talking about because I think that's somewhat fair, but if you see a Jalen Polk behind him, even a Ricky Pearsall, like you said, I wouldn't be taking Xavier Leggett despite that first round capital and maybe the perception that he's got this new play caller and it's going to be things turning around in Carolina. I don't know yeah. if you bet on that as opposed to with Pearsall, you already see an offense that's ready to go. And if he gets inserted into it, we know that there's going to be production happening. So I think that's a really good take on these guys. I think I'm maybe a little bit more, um, optimistic towards Leggett, but one of the worst analytical profiles you will ever see. He never had more than 29 targets before his fifth season, and he yep. needed to get to a place where Spencer Rattler was playing above average college quarterback play before he ever did that. So I think a lot of this is tied to Bryce Young. Bryce Young still yep. continues to be shit. Xavier Leggett is not going to succeed, but with a big turnaround from Bryce Young, I think we might be able to see, you know, some gradual progression of skill set and talent in the NFL from Xavier Leggett, but probably tough sledding for the first couple of seasons. So maybe he's a guy that as he starts to put it together, you get him as like a throw in on deals, but there is like some serious trail and Burks vibes happening here for me. I will, I will say that for sure. Yeah. I mean, like, that's the thing. I, I think, you know, they talked about him already needing some polish at certain parts of his game. So yeah, he's a guy that I just feel like where he's going right now, you're probably going to be able to get him cheaper a year from now, but. Yeah, totally. So I alluded to those second round wide receivers and the one that I talked about that is probably going to play X receiver and has issues with separating is Keon Coleman. Uh, he was drafted with that 33rd pick that the Bills traded back with the Carolina Panthers for. Your boy went a few picks later. Uh, I believe it was at 34. That was Lad McConkey, the pick that the Patriots yep. traded. Uh, then Jalen Polk went with that 37th pick. We've kind of covered him a little bit with the Drake May stuff. And then Adonai Mitchell goes in the middle of the second to the Colts, who are absolutely thrilled to get him there. Um, so why don't you give a rank on these guys, Wiz? Coleman, McConkey, Polk, A.D. Mitchell. Coleman, McConkey, Polk, A.D. Mitchell. So I've definitely got Lad one out of this group, no doubt about it. Um, I think Lad's going to smash in his landing spot in with the Chargers and Herbert. Um, this next group is really tough for me. I think just given kind of what I like, what I don't like about Coleman and Adnai, I think I might go Polk two here. And then I'll, I hate this decision, but I guess I'll go Coleman three and I'll go Adonai yeah. four. Um, that's just kind of how I see it right now. I've got some volume concerns for Adonai. I think he's probably better from a real life perspective for them taking the top off right now than necessarily from a fantasy perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and Coleman, I think if anything, they're going to try and force the issue with him a little bit so that maybe that's why he does get some volume. I don't know how efficient he's going to be on it. You alluded to the X receiver piece, but that's probably how I rank him right now. Trav, what about you? I think I might differ just a little bit. I have McConkey first, like you. Um, yep. Then I would have Coleman over Polk by just a hair because mm -hmm. of the expected volume, because of the um, quarterback play with Josh Allen. Um, but I'm not like super firm on that necessarily, right? Because I think I think I like the skill set for Polk better, but it's more the compiler of volume that makes Keon go ahead of him because the Bills That's are fair. in dire need of that big body wide receiver. And That's we heard fair. their coach say as much, like he's going to be involved right away. But definite concerns, man. Like he does not separate, does not get much for yards after the catch. And he's now with a quarterback who long has had a perception of having a bit of a wild man's arm. Uh, yep. Stefan Diggs was kind of the perfect storm for him because Stefan Diggs knows nothing but three yards of separation. Um, and yeah. that was good for Josh Allen because he could just drop it in this monstrous bucket. 
and Stefan Diggs was going to go get it. So um, I think that's the biggest concern for sure about Keon Coleman. Uh, I'm still kind of okay with him in the middle of that second round because of the volume. And if it, if there is a hit and if he does turn some things around, it's going to be a really nice hit whiz. But I hear a lot of people talking about him potentially moving into the slot. And I don't know, like, I don't know if the bills are in a position to do that a, and then B you look at some of the stats like last season from the slot, he had three and a half yards after the catch per reception, 1.58 yards per route run uh, wasn't great. And that was the only season where he had more than 20% slot snaps in college. Okay. So, um, and I think he was at 29 point something last season with Florida state. So I pulled from that, but yeah, like I said, range of outcomes is wide with Keon Coleman. And I think if you take them, you're just going to have to live or die with whatever he does for you because it's going to be a world where he hits and you don't want to sell him or he misses and you're not going to be able to sell him for a bag of pucks. So yeah, tough one. I think the path to volume is all we, all we really care about for Keon. Yeah, I think you're right, Trav. I think there's probably going to be some efficiency issues if they do kind of stick him on the outside and and try to do that big that X roll outside for him there. Um, I is probably going to have some boom plays that are going to make you know, give people that a look into that upside that he does have. But we've heard people like Harmon kind of harp on it a little bit is that, you know, this guy seems relegated or would be best successful in that big slot role. And it just doesn't seem like that's in their plans. So, you know, it's push comes to shove. We're going to see what happens. Yeah. Push will definitely come to shove. Uh, Lad McConkey went to the chargers. They exiled all of their pass catchers before the season. Quentin Johnson yeah. or the, the corpse of is still there on the depth chart. Canadian Josh Palmer is there. And while he hasn't, he's had Canadian. Like 10, yeah. He's Canadian. Yeah. Well, he hasn't that. had mega returns. Uh, I still like the player and I think he's a guy who can play on the outside, but I'm not, I don't have the illusion that he's playing over lad or probably yeah. over Quentin Johnson either. Although he played over QJ last year for quite a run. So I don't think uh, Jim Harbaugh would be hesitant to kind of pull the plug on QJ if he had to. I think everything that you think was, I think this is good. He instantly goes in there. He's their most talented wide receiver for sure. Um, for sure. And he should be their best producing wide receiver. One thing that gives me pause a little bit, and it's not even like much pause. It's more of just like a blip is that we talked to Scott Barrett last week. And I mentioned that lad does play outside and inside and Scott kind of pushed back in saying that he thinks he probably definitely just profiles better as a wide receiver in the slot from the NFL mm -hmm. perspective. My thing with the Chargers is with the amount that they want to run, I feel like they're going to be in a lot of heavy sets. And I just wonder in those one wide receiver sets, is he going to be that one wide receiver? You know what I mean? What does That's that fair. look like? Is he going to be running on the outside more than we expected because they don't have as many wide receivers on the field? And then from an NFL level, how does he win from the outside? versus in the slot. So that's maybe my only little blip on that lad McConkey radar. And some of it may be just kind of like, kind of like prepping myself just in case it doesn't smash that I kind of like have a little fallback to say, okay, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Um, but yeah, I think like it's, it's all looking really good for lad in Los Angeles. Cause I don't think Quentin Johnson's going to get resurrected as much as I love Josh Palmer. I don't think he is going to put much dent in what ladder should do. No, man, I think, look, he's going to be Herbert's wide receiver one, probably, you know, target 1A there. And I think there's a very realistic scenario here where he competes like from a – I've been critical of Justin Herbert's dynasty value just from I'm worried about the overall volume and as well as if there's any sort of volume hit, he's really going to have to increase his like touchdown ratio. And with the group of pass catchers there right now, I worry about that. But at the same time, they have such a lack of depth there or talent at the pass catching position where – he's lad's going to get enough no matter what um i would not be surprised if he challenges malik neighbors from a target perspective around 120 and i think he's easy wide receiver three in this rookie season amongst yeah. the wide receivers so yeah for sure i would i would have to mull between him and worthy and maybe a little bit of brian thomas jr but probably him and worthy maybe uh but it yep. is definitely definitely close um and it'll be interesting to see how that chargers offense just looks overall right because um for me when i was val when i was doing my dynasty rankings for quarterbacks lad mcconkey is the reason where i didn't automatically just move justin herbert down kind of past mm -hmm. a couple of those rookies right but before that i was prepared for justin herbert to be like outside of the top 12 potentially with what that offense is putting out there from a pass catching perspective so yep. big boost from lad and then ad like he's I don't think we need to spend too much time because there is like a super void 
in target share for him. Uh, we're going to have to see him go in there, show high effort, which has yeah. been an issue for Adonai Mitchell um, to be able to come in here and command some of those targets with these guys that they've got in there. So I think we're kind of waiting and seeing on AD. If I take a peek at where he was taken in those drafts, just to give everybody a bit of a gauge on the value. One of the things, yeah, while yeah, you're doing ahead. that, one of the yeah. things that's important to note here is that the Colts were, the Colts were pretty effusive of their praise for him, right? I think Ballard went on a Ballard went on a nice little tirade as far as you know the media tearing this kid down and everything like that. So I will say it certainly seems like you know they do, they do like what he's potentially able to bring to the table there. But like when you've got Michael Pittman, I think Josh Downs is still going to play like a role there. You've got Jonathan Taylor. You've got you know a running quarterback in Anthony Richardson who you know maybe they tone some of that down this year to try and keep him on the field a bit more but yeah I, I think for me it's it's a volume question for for ad at this point yeah and seeing 206 and 207 is where he went in those drafts um yeah. i might look elsewhere at that price if we're being completely honest uh, but i think what chris ballard said in that uh, in that interview was look guys i'm really sorry about all my swearing except i'm not except and then just continue yeah and then he just, yeah, yeah. just kept going <laughs> awesome. he goes i'm sorry about all the swearing but this is just fucking ridiculous <laughs> yeah it was awesome. That was awesome. I love that when coaches just go off off the deep end because we all fucking do it sometimes. And so for me, like, fly off the deep end, buddy. I gotta say, I'm man, just... I like Ballard a lot. I like I like that too. Like I like uh, I like when a guy goes to bat for players. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Talked about Z Xavier Leggett in Carolina, and Carolina mm. came back and they drafted Jonathan Brooks with the forty sixth pick jumped ahead of the Dallas Cowboys who Jerry yeah. Jones was not quiet about the fact that he wanted Jonathan Brooks. I think he said in all of my 30 years doing this, he was the best interview I've ever had at a pre-draft yeah. press conference. And then and, Stephen Jones like nudges him. Like and nudging says, hey, him. Hey dude, why don't you give him the whole draft board? Yeah. <laughs> oh, suck it Dallas. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I was kind of happy about that, even though it's kind of a worse landing spot. I will say that uh, moves into Carolina that has more competition for him in Miles Sanders and Chuba Hubbard, also a Canadian. Um, Interesting. Yeah, Chuba, he's uh, he's from Alberta. We interviewed him on the True North Fantasy Football podcast a couple years That's ago. That's awesome. Oh, Fun Dizone. nugget. Yeah, DeZone actually reached out to us through emailing our website. And I thought it was fake. So I'm like, okay, well, let's see if this is a fake scammer. And I like email him back and I'm like, holy shit, boys, this is real. And that's we too funny. Cuba Hubbard. So that is a fun little factoid. Go back to the True North Fantasy Football YouTube channel to check that out. Um, but looks like Chuba's, um, Chuba's tenure as maybe the 1B or a piece of a tandem might be coming to an end. Um, I think Jonathan Brooks is easily the cream of this crop in Carolina. And I really kind of like this landing spot with Dave Canales, right? We saw what he did with Rashad White in Tampa yep. Bay. I think most importantly, we saw his willingness to use Rashad White as a bell cow. Rashad Bell among running backs last season was top 10 in snap share and carry share. And he had the 12th highest running back target share as well from looking at the bell cow report via our friends, the Fantasy Points data suite. And he finished as the running back four for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So if there is any of that connotation surrounding Jonathan Brooks, Wiz, I want all of it. Of course, the ACL injury is kind of the elephant in his room. But let me know what you think about maybe the short term and then the long term for Jonathan Brooks. So the long term, you know, I know it's not the Dallas landing spot that you alluded to, um, but I do think this is a pretty damn good landing spot for Jonathan Brooks long term. You know, I think at worst, you're probably seeing Miles Sanders out at the probably next year. Um, if you look at his dead cap hit next year, it's just two point nine million dollars. A um, little bit heftier this year at 10.4. I think I've already seen some discussions as far as is he out the door even as soon as this offseason? Um, could he be an option for somebody like Dallas if he you know does get out the door? Uh, that would be really interesting. Um, but look, I think you know Chuba performed admirably at his admirably at his during his time there last year. But I think to your point, what we saw out of Rashad White in Tampa Bay with Dave Canales last year shows that he is willing to have that bell cow. And you've seen the way Jonathan Brooks can contribute in both the run game and the pass game, you know, pretty smooth receiver, solid pass blocker. So it's not like he should have any issue staying on the field, especially, you know, you want to have a really good pass blocking back when you've got somebody like Bryce young there. Um, so look, I think he's 20 years old. I think you alluded to the ACL as well, Trav. 
temper expectations in the beginning. This is absolutely his backfield at the, by the end of the year. And this is firmly his backfield going forward. You know, he's a guy that I think I have right now. Where am I looking here? So if I look at my dynasty ranks, I've got him as high as RB 12. Oh man, that is steamy. Man, running back 12. I got him at running back yeah. 18. So I think that's still like pretty, pretty yeah. high on him. Right. And I love the fact that you're taking that stance on Jonathan Brooks, because I think he does have that profile as a tackle breaker, somebody who can take on some workload, make guys miss. Uh, really excited to see him come back and be something in the league. I think it might be that gradual incline, of course, with the injury, but sure. I think you might be able to see a little dip on Jonathan Brooks. We're still seeing him go at the top of second rounds because of that landing spot and the, the outlook that he will be the running back one. But yeah, I think uh, it's going to be really nice for Jonathan Brooks with Dave Canales in that offense. I, the one thing that I do want to see is like, how does that ACL recover and what does that do to his potential yeah. to break away from NFL cornerbacks and safeties if he's making some big runs? I think those some of those questions were in place before the injury a little bit, but um, I think now they're maybe a little bit more prevalent. But I think with the fact that the NFL was this high on him and that Dave Canales went and wanted to trade up ahead of the Dallas Cowboys. That's nothing but good signs. No, I, I think Jonathan your, Brooks. your point, Trav, right? Like 46 is legit cap, legit draft capital for running backs. And especially for a running back coming off an ACL, like that's telling me that he might've even gone a little bit higher. Um, so in this day and age, obviously last year, you kind of had the anomaly with, with Bijan and Jameer Gibbs kind of going in that like top half of that first there, but 46 in this day and age in the NFL, it's legit draft capital for him. Yeah. Well, we were saying, I think last week or the week before that we didn't think we were going to see any running backs go in that top 50 and we yep. did. So we're going to move into the third round now Wiz. um, this is one of my favorite things that we have on the show sheet actually is those running backs that went in the third. And those would be yep. Trey Benson taken by the Arizona Cardinals, Blake Corum taken by the Los Angeles Rams. How about that and one? Marshawn huh? Lloyd taken by the Green Bay Packers. All of them went in the third round. I think we like these landing spots a lot, all out of in, from a varying degree, of course. Um, but why don't you rank these three for 2024? Mainly, I want to see who your favorite is for this coming season, Wiz. Oh God, for 2024, this is tough, man, because we'll talk when you dino, think about, worry. Oh, yeah, no, I know, but it's a good question for 2024 because they're all behind guys that are like legit fantasy options, right? Um, I will go, I will go, and I'm sorry to do this to my man, James Conner, but maybe we see him just, he takes a bit of a hit on the health side again. He's getting a bit older. I, this is really close between the three, but I will go Benson, Corum, Lloyd. Yeah, I think that's how I have it as well. I just love the fact that Benson is attached to a Kyler Murray backfield, has Marvin yep. Harrison Jr. taking a lot of eyes from defenses, and he's kind of that one-cut slash runner who I think can, can succeed really nicely in this offense. Yeah. Um, and we've seen James Conner get some targets as well in this offense, and so maybe that can translate down to Trey Benson. Uh, this does kill my Michael Carter takes, Wiz. Uh, Michael Carter was one of my favorite yeah, free 99 buys in Dynasty. Yep. Um, I think that's probably dead unless you catch like an injury or two, but man, I think that guy's definitely got some tread still left on the tires. Uh, but say la vie, say la vie, uh, Trey Benson is going to be nice. Um, the dynasty perspective is very interesting, uh, but we will get there for Blake Corum. Like he's my second, uh, because I just like, I've never been the hugest Kyron Williams believer. Um, mm -hmm. I know that he had a monster season last year, but we've kind of seen a lot of guys rotate through that Sean McVay backfield. I think the difference with Kyron Williams is we've never seen any of them blow up like Kyron Williams did. But I think before Kyron Williams was the guy getting the job, Sean McVay wanted it to be Cam Akers and wanted it to be Daryl Henderson. So I think um, it's like, very hot hand approach happening here. Um, and I think if Blake Corup gets some of that run, his hands can get pretty hot in this offense. I think of his red zone prowess, especially because this team is going to be making red zone trips. And I think he's probably a better red zone runner than Kyron Williams. And Kyron Williams on all that volume and all that production last season still wasn't the most efficient running back, even though he finished as like a top, I think he's like a top seven or something like that. Um, yeah, from point, points per game perspective, he was like, I think he was RB2. That's crazy. right. That's right. So I like 
I definitely could take some pie in the face on this one, but I think last season was a bit of a perfect storm for Kyron Williams, being that there was no other backfield comp competition. Mm -hmm. Blake Corum is some serious backfield competition who has eaten carries before, has scored a lot of touchdowns before, and this is an offense that can feed carries and score touchdowns. So, man, like in that best ball draft that I'm in, Wiz, Kyron Williams still went as the 201. And to me, that is way, oh, wow. way yeah. steep for me because I think I don't think it's going on a limb to say that Blake Corum's going to come in and get 30% of that work right away. You know what I mean? Like, I just yeah. have a hard time seeing that whole pie going straight back to Kyron. I know we saw it last year, so maybe I'm, this is crazy talk. But what do you think about that, Wiz? Because I think people aren't giving enough credit to that landing spot and how much damage Corm could do in it. Yeah, part of me wonders, yeah, and I've seen this kind of circulate a little bit the last couple of days. Like, are are we trying to overthink this that this is another tank and ETN situation, right? Where we see that third round running back and we're we're worried about them eating into it. A lot of people, including myself, are like, you know, is that gonna hurt ETN? Um, I think one of the things that you mentioned is really interesting to see how we're gonna see that play out, right? Is that McVeigh does tend to ride that hot hand a little bit. But one of the things we saw from Kyron last year was as that workload kind of increased and they really did rely on him, you know, he got hurt, right? So is this more look, we're still gonna kind of ride Kyron like we did last year, but now we've just got a better backup plan if he does go down? Or is this a true, we want to lighten his workload and sub somebody in like a quorum? Um, I kind of lean towards the latter, Trav, right? So I do kind of see your point as far as, yeah, I, I don't think necessarily Blake Corm is just insurance as a third round pick. So I, I kind of do lean that he's taken some away from Kyron. Yeah, yeah, totally. So um, should be fun either way. That's an offense that we want pieces of. So Yep. Whether you're in best ball drafts, whether you're late in a redraft draft, whether you're in dino drafts, just you want to grab pieces of the Rams offense because there's going to be production happening there. Um, with the running backs, you know, Corum especially, you might just have to kind of wait a little bit to see what he's carving out before you can be confident and relying on him in a flex spot, let's say. For sure. Um, Dynasty whiz. Like I was doing those running back rankings and these guys are all like right in the back of that top 24. So this is super preliminary. I haven't done full digging. This is just kind of my raw kind of throwing it in there with my thoughts off the dome ski. Um, I've got Trey Benson in that kind of 20 area, then Corum 23, and then um, Marshawn Lloyd right in that kind of 26 area. So almost a little tier there of these running backs. Um, and maybe I'm a little more bullish on Blake Corum, but would you have from a dynasty perspective, Marshawn Lloyd ahead of him? Uh, I do have Marshawn Lloyd ahead of Blake Corum. Um, yeah. And the only reason why I say that is because they're, the way that Josh Jacobs' contract is structured mm -hmm. really isn't that four-year, $48 million deal that, you know, a lot of people think it is. Um, you know, I think there's an out after this year. You know, the dead cap's a little bit more. I think it's about close to $11 million, But I think the dead cap number after 25, that second year, um, is only about $4 million bucks. Right. So and and Kyron is on that rookie deal there for at least the next couple of years. So I think it's just very similar situations. But, you know, I do kind of I lean Lloyd there. I think it's close, Trav. I think when I look at my rank preliminary rankings here, I've got Lloyd kind of around like like that 26 range ish. And I've got, you know, Corum closer to like 33, 30 something around there. Right. Um, just because, look, I do think that at, to your point, right? Like Kyron's probably going to still get the bulk of that work and it's going to take an injury for, for him to really creep up for Corm to creep up into RB2 territory. As far as Benson goes, um, look, we've, uh, you know, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. Cor or, uh, Connor's getting a little bit old in the tooth there. Um, he's been there. He's been super productive. He's been one of the better values in fantasy for, you know, his ADP at his age for the last couple of years now um, was still extremely efficient too. in that drew Petzling offense last year, but, all signs kind of point to this being the last year. I'd be really surprised if they brought him back. I've got Benson inside my top 15. I've got him at 14 right now. Oh, yeah. I'm doing my rankings and I'm like, I'm being fucking spicy here. I got yeah. Benson is right at running back 20 in dynasty for me. Um, but I love that Riz. I love that. And maybe, maybe like the windows that we're evaluating our dynasty ranks are a little bit different, right? Cause maybe mine's sure. maybe a little bit more short term or whatever, but, uh, I like that. And I could see by the end of this process, me having Trey Benson up in that neighborhood, in which case I'd have to get Jonathan Brooks up in the same neighborhood as you as well. I think so. I like it Wiz. you're making me think about these dynasty rankings as we go through the show. And that's the, uh, the, the way I look at these guys, Trav, is I think that these guys are probably going to be the cheapest they are right now. 
Yeah. Um, I think as the year goes on and people start to realize that, not that people haven't realized this already, but you know maybe the casual player hasn't. But as soon as we get to October, November, I guarantee you're going to start seeing tweets, go buy Trey Benson right now because John, James Conner is out at the end of the year. Well, newsflash, maybe just like try and go do it right now, right? Because yeah. it's, he's going to be more expensive if you're trying to go get him in October. Yeah, and he's in that kind of like top third of the second round as well. So decent capital in rookie drafts there. And I think it's just super interesting that these running backs were um, said to be one of the worst classes. And then they went to like banger landing spots, in my I opinion, um, yeah. if we include these third round guys and then Jonathan Brooks and then another guy that were especially one other guy that we're going to talk about in the fourth round. But to stick to the third round, Wiz, we got lots of wide receivers that went there. This is where yep. lots of questions abound um, because we're going to be taking those late second, early third shots on some of these guys in rookie drafts, and we need to know. So if we look at Malachi Corley, he was the first wide receiver off the board in the third, went to the Jets with pick number 65. Jermaine Burton went to Cincinnati, pick number 80, both awesome landing spots. Roman Wilson, the Roman Empire will now be built from steel, went to Pittsburgh, and he was the 84th pick. I love that fit too. Then Jalen Millen, Jalen McMillan, somebody who I was maybe a little bit higher than consensus on, went to the Buccaneers at 92. And then Luke McCaffrey with the last pick of the third round. So let's look at these guys. So maybe let's start uh, firing maybe a little quicker on some of these guys as we get through the draft whiz, but let's talk about it because it's all worth it, right? So Malachi Corley, I think the hope for him is that he can come in and he can be kind of that Randall Cobb slot role for Aaron Rodgers yeah. doing a bunch of his work after the catch because we know that's his calling card. What do you think about Malachi Corley in that landing spot? I think I think as a team, we were maybe a little bit down on him, but he was very polarizing. So did that landing spot move the needle for you when it comes to Malachi Corley? Um, not really. I think when you think about Rogers track record with rookies, um, it's, you know, suspect at best as far as trust. Yeah. Um, and, you know, looking at Malachi's, you know, college profile, really fun player. Like, I don't want to take that away from him at all, but, uh, really low ADOT player, a bit of a gadget player, if you will. But again, extremely exciting. If he can figure out how to start, you know, kind of making more of an impact and running some of the, some of, some more of those routes down the field, um, that would really be interesting. I think that the, the, the the blueprint for success that you'd like to see for him is maybe something similar to how the chiefs used Rasheed Rice last year, right? Yeah. It's like very close to the line of scrimmage, um, you know, really kind of take over that middle area of the field there. Um, really short stuff is, is kind of how I see Malachi, but like you've got Brees Hall in the backfield and you've got Mike Williams and Garrett Wilson on the outside. Um, so yeah, it, look, I think he's a fun player, but not necessarily someone I'm targeting from a dynasty perspective. Yeah, for sure. So I'm looking at that draft and Malachi Corley went at the 310, which I don't think is terrible value. But I think the problem for me is that I don't think he fully hits his stride, even if he gets work with Aaron Rodgers. Obviously, Aaron Rodgers boosts him, but I don't know if he fully hits his stride and carves out his place in this offense until Aaron Rodgers is gone. And then we've mm -hmm. got a whole bunch more kind of turbulence around his situation, let's say, since we're talking about the Jets um not knowing nice. what the quarterback situation nice. you like that you like that yeah that, that was um, really good i didn't even think about like as i said turbulence i that wasn't was even thinking about the link to the jets but i was like man yeah. fuck kind of a rapper no big deal guys in case that was good episode yeah <laughs> um uh so yeah we don't mind that spot with the jets uh shout out to abe and the boys doing jets uncovered make sure you go check that out and follow all of the work for your favorite team i think we have like eight nine ten teams on board now wiz is one of the two participants in Patriots Uncovered on the Dan and Dan show, I like to call it. Uh, love what you guys are doing over there. Shout out to Grimberg. Shout out to Abe for all of the work on Uncovered because people are liking it, man. It's really good. Jermaine Burton, 80th mm. pick to Cincinnati. You liked this one, Wiz. Tell me what you think about it. I did. This is probably my favorite pick out of the third round, third round okay. wide receivers. Uh, really not close for me either. So, you know, the, obviously this is a guy that – from a little bit character concerns we kind of heard coming in the draft we know of that incident you know he had on the field there at the Tennessee game with that you know that girl but all that aside right really like exciting talent um you know tough guy is not afraid to go over the middle really strong hands as Zach Taylor mentioned in his press conference didn't have one drop the way I look at this is from you know that dynasty perspective is he's attached to Joe Burrow and T Higgins is likely out the door next year right so I just see a world with him where he, as long as he keeps his head on straight, that he's probably the wide receiver too in that offense next year. 
And, you know, if we can see, maybe he gives us a little Tyler Boyd feel this year as he gets up to speed and play like works his way up and, you know, gets up to speed with that offense through that kind of slot role. And then we see him go on the outside a little bit. They can kick those guys around, right? We've seen Chase kick into the slot at times. So, but I just, I love his outlook long-term because I think he's the wide receiver too in a Joe Burrow offense next year. Yeah. I think you're spot on. And I think even if T Higgins were to leave this year, I don't know if we would necessarily steam Burton way up the ladder versus how we might next year. If he's only the wide receiver too, because if T Higgins goes, I could yeah. see like a Tyler Boyd coming back into the fold. But mm -hmm. I think what that does is that puts Tyler Boyd into the slot and lets Jermaine Burton play on the outside, exactly. in which case there's a little bit more ceiling that comes along with that position there. So I like what you said on Jermaine Burton and I feel pretty much the same another offense we want to attach to i think one of my favorites in this group was roman wilson i love that mm -hmm. fit in pittsburgh definitely have some questions about volume in that run heavy offense with old Artie smith um, but we know that uh george pickens can be a little bit streaky maybe a little bit sporadic um, and i think roman wilson does a lot of things that george pickens doesn't right yeah. he does a lot of that over the middle work he does a lot of that dirty stuff he does a lot of blocking which i think is going to be a big piece of his ability to get on this field with the Pittsburgh Agreed. Steelers. I think he's the wide receiver two there. And while, you know, he might not get a ton of volume because they run the ball a lot. I think the volume he gets, he can make the most of it and maybe carve out some role because I don't think just because of what we've seen with Arthur Smith previously, I don't think that means that 100% we will not get a second wide receiver that produces out of this offense. Um, I think we just need to be a little bit cautious as to how we attack that because that is a possibility with Roman Wilson. Other guy that I like here, Wiz, and I'll give you the chance to come and check back in yeah. on these guys yourself was Jalen McMillan. And I think that's just mm -hmm. because people are dogging that spot. And I don't think it's as bad as everybody thinks. Sure, yeah. it's attached to Baker for maybe the long term. We don't know if that's long term, but I think everybody's seeing Godwin and Evans. And I think he's just a year two proposition, basically, for me. Godwin, they can get out of that contract after this season. And I would expect yep. them to do so, especially with taking Jalen McMillan with the second pick he profiles as a predominant slot receiver. I think he was over 90% in college yeah. at Washington. And there were times where he was out producing Jalen Polk. In fact, last year, if he didn't get hurt, he was tracking to probably have a better season than did Jalen Polk. So I think Jalen McMillan is live to um, return on the investment that you're going to put into him. When I look at kind of where he's going in the drafts that we've been in 312. So he's going behind Malachi Corley and I would take him ahead of Malachi Corley. Absolutely. Uh, what's your thoughts on Jalen McMillan and Roman Wilson Wiz? Yeah. So it's funny, Trev, because in the beginning, you know, right after the draft, I really hadn't put too much. I, I was one of those guys that didn't really like the landing spot for Jalen McMillan. And then I was thinking about it. I was actually talking about it with Danny, Danny Kelly a little bit earlier today is, you know, he was like, Hey, I keep ending up with Burton. And one of the things we talked about was like why I like Burton and his outlook and everything like that. And then I just took a deeper look at Godwin realizing that they can get out of that contract next year as well. So why am I not thinking about McMillan the same way that I am thinking about Burton? And that's when I've kind of started to come around on McMillan a little bit more um, because you're right. Like he was pretty productive at Washington during his time there, even with both Polk and Adunze going in the same draft, um, you know, from a model score perspective, he came in in the 73rd percentile, which is, it's a very solid score. Um, you know, he's better than, or just about better than three quarters of the 215 mod receivers that we've run through it. Right. So, um, I think he's a guy that's, that's probably being slept on too much at this point in drafts, especially if, you know, you mentioned there that he just went almost the end of the third, um, for a third round wide receiver that could be the predominant slot player next year. I think that's nice investment. Um, as far as Roman Wilson, look, I like the, I think he can do some things. I think he is very different than George Pickens to your point. Um, I would have some of the same concerns you do. He does some things that he doesn't do, but also at the same time, the volume is probably not going to be there. Um, that's kind of, I'm look, not a guy that I'm probably targeting at this point, just because as long as he's going to be a wide receiver too, in an Arthur Smith offense, I'll just look elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And maybe I'm kind of looking down the road a little bit and thinking, you know, you That's never fair. know if Arthur Smith's going to be there long, but those, those are all the same concerns I have just maybe a little bit more rosy on that. I think that could be a fun little group. Luke McCaffrey was also in that third round. We did talk about how he fits in with that offense in Washington already though. Other just skill position player that was taken was tip Ryman on the show sheet. I've got in quotes, just the tip. Cause I think that would be a quality <laughs> quality nickname and speaking of just the tip i know almost nothing about this guy um is this the guy that doesn't believe in birds this is the is guy that does not about? believe in birds yes ah, yeah okay i yeah. hate him fun fun tip rhyme and nugget 
Yeah, can't hate him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah look, I mean, the, the tip Ryman, it was kind of a curious pick, right? You've got Trey McBride there. I will say he's like an athletic freak. Um, he, I think his RAS score ranked 10th out of like 1,200 tight ends since 19, like in the, like out of the last 1,200 tight ends, he was ranked 10th from a RAS perspective. So look, super athletic, um, but just wonder if he's, he's kind of, made for that offense from a blocking tight end perspective, right? That can leak out and do some things. And maybe if he gets the ball in his hands can make some plays, but let's make no mistake about it. Like this is, if anything, they're trying to free Trey McBride up to run more routes. And I would just wouldn't be surprised to, to see Trey, Trey McBride gravitate towards more of that. Like Kelsey Kincaid through just like Mark Andrews, just run your routes, bro. And get out of there. Yeah, we want to see that. We want yeah. to see that for Trey McBride. Okay, Wiz, we're creeping up on two bills here, so let's keep her rolling. Yeah. Uh, fourth round. Fourth round was very, very fun. A bunch of the tight ends went. We're not going to spend too much time on them because I think as you get to this range of the draft, these guys are probably still dart throws, but Jatavian Sanders went to the Carolina Panthers at the top. Um, had uh, They had the international people calling the picks and the German dude that announced Jatavian Sanders pick was awesome. Awesome. Keep pounding. <laughs> Keep yeah, pounding. I know that was, that was funny. <laughs> it's great. Theo Johnson, another athletic freak at pick one Oh seven, one of Dino Joe's favorites. Shout out. Uh, Eric all went to Cincinnati. They got another athletic tight end late in the draft in uh, Tanner McLaughlin as well. AJ Barner to Seattle, Cade Stover, Jared Wiley. Uh, will you be attacking any of these guys in 2024 Wiz? maybe at the end of some of our best ball builds as we get into hashtag best ball season? Um, yeah, I think. And then do you have a favorite long term bet just to kind of wrap these guys all in one? Yeah, no, I think if I'm targeting anybody in 24, Trav, it's probably Jatavian is like maybe one of those late, late best ball options. Um, you know, there really isn't much there at tight end right now. So can he come in and be that guy? Um, fourth round draft capital, not too bad for him. Theo, super athletic, but. Daniel Bellinger is really not bad at this point. And I just Malik neighbors is the guy there. I think the guy, if I'm thinking about long-term Trev and, and who may be exciting is Eric all um, one of the tight ends that went to Cincinnati. Um, I know they took Tanner as well. And it's funny when we were prepping for the show, one of the things that I mentioned was I wouldn't be surprised if like, this is like the new Musgrave craft kind of argument, right? Like Eric all is a guy that's had trouble staying healthy, but also like, at flash when he has been healthy. So could he be a guy that we see he gets hot out of the gates? I, I know they did bring in Mike Jasicki. Um, so there is that to think him. about. Yeah. <laughs> Just a big one. Irrational. Irrational. Yeah. love Mike Jasicki. Irrational. Yeah. Um, but look, I think if I'm excited about one of these guys from a dynasty perspective or taking a flyer on him, Eric all is probably the guy I'm doing that with. And you, you can do that much later on in drafts. Yeah, yeah, he's probably almost free in in those rookie yeah. drafts as well. I like everything you said there. Yeah, he's attached to probably the best offense. Um, yep. It'd be interesting to see them start to utilize the tight end a little bit more. Uh, Sanders, that Carolina offense brings those questions. Theo Johnson is super athletic. Darren Waller retired, um, so he could get some work, but Bellinger is there. For me, Like I, I'm with you on everything you said. The other guys down the list, Cade Stover, Jared Wiley, I would definitely throw those guys on a tight end premium taxi squad yeah. if I have a fifth round or if I'm getting some guys after the draft as kind of undrafted free agents in those dynasty leagues. Cade Stover is now attached to his college quarterback, uh, CJ Stroud, who was super excited about the pick. And then Jared yep. Wiley was drafted. He's a big athletic guy as well, drafted behind Travis Kelsey. We know they might be starting a succession plan soon, so worth that taxi squad flyer. The wide receivers, though. Troy Franklin and Javon Baker, we covered them a little bit. Franklin at 102 to Denver, Baker at 110 to New England. We also had Devontae Walker, that deep threat, go at 113 to Baltimore. Jacob Cowing for the San Francisco 49ers to uh, double up uh, uh, on the wide receiver nice. position nice. Um, after taking Pearsall in the first. So, yeah, we talked a little uh, little Franklin and Baker, so maybe we can kind of leave those guys off, I guess. What, what are your hopes for Tez? And then what are your hopes for Cowing? Uh, Tez is just the guy that I'll probably be completely avoiding. Um, if yeah. he falls to me in the fourth round somewhere, great. But I just don't see how he's going to really earn volume. He's probably just going to... He's going to be a cardio machine out there running those deep routes. Um, I really want no part of a deep threat in Baltimore there. 
Um, and then as far as Jacob Cowling goes, look, maybe he becomes interesting if we see kind of like what we talked about with Pearsall earlier. If we see some one of the top guys exit, then he becomes interesting. He is a player that, you know, I probably liked a little bit more of some of the other guys that have gone in this draft. He's a fun player, uh, but I just from it's it's hard to see his dynasty outlook. It's probably a bit murky. He's probably a nice just wait and see guy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I feel you on that. Like. Tez, like it's kind of intriguing to think about a uh, productive deep threat in the Baltimore offense, but I think what we want from Zay Flowers is a little bit more downfield work out of the slot, and we don't necessarily want some guy taking that whole pie so Flowers can't get it, right? And so, yeah, I just think we haven't wanted the second wide receiver for Baltimore for years, and nothing last season told me that we do now. Um, and I'm not even sure Tez comes in to become the second one because we still have the candle burning for Rashad Bateman. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then cowing again, a guy we liked, he is very buried, but he's buried on a great offense. So I wouldn't necessarily yeah. be taking him, you know, in, I, I don't know, like late fourth, early fifth, if I have a fifth round. Um, but I would be trying to probably go elsewhere looking for guys who have more immediate paths to production, but love the player, love the player. I've seen him go undrafted in a couple drafts, and that's a guy that if he hit, um, you know, if you've got the 412, I would cer uh, there's certainly worse uh, things that you could do than take uh, Jacob Cowing. And if he did make it to waivers, then he'd be a guy I'd absolutely be throwing a claim in on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I might even say the same for Tez, just because, you know, he does have a skill that if given targets can produce easy, if that makes sense, like he doesn't have to be a route technician necessarily produce the way he produces, yeah. but again, like more of just an add to the bench, because we did hear that Todd Munkin last season was kind of going to open up the Lamar Jackson offense. We saw that to an extent, but to me, that would mean more wide receivers producing and we didn't see that. So, you know, yeah. dart throws at best. Running backs in the fourth round were extra fun, Wiz. We had Jalen Wright. The Miami Dolphins traded up to draft Jalen White, or Jalen Wright, sorry. Uh, I think they traded a third-round pick next year to take him with the fourth-round pick this year, which tells me something. Bucky Irving went in the fourth round. I was stoked, man, stoked. Didn't I love the landing spot to Tampa Bay, um, yeah. but I was stoked that he got that kind of draft capital because I was pissed that he wasn't running a second 40. I thought he was going to be gone in like the sixth round, which is basically That's what I was thinking like, too. put yeah. him in the dirt. But then the Bucks came and just turned everything around in the fourth round. Will Shipley to my birds, Ray Davis. Isaac or Ray Davis went to Buffalo. Isaac Garendo went to San Francisco. Braylon Allen, who we hate, went to the New York <laughs> Jets. Um, who are you looking at here, Wiz? Who stands out to you as somebody you're going to be attacking in drafts, whether well, Dynasty really, or 2024? Yeah, I mean, look, 2024, I think really one of the only guys that's I, I think is probably going to make anything of an impact or more of an impact than others is Ray Davis. I, I do see Ray Davis having a role in 24 and look, if something ever happened to James cook, now he's like the RB one in a Josh Allen offense. Right. Um, whereas you look at somebody like Jalen, Wright, You know, say most goes down, like he's still got to deal with a chain there. Right. Or if one of those two, like he's still RB three there. Uh, Bucky Irving's another interesting one. I do see the, the only problem there is like one of Bucky's calling cards is receiving and Rashad White is like a good receiving back. Um, so I wonder if they maybe pivot uh, some of the early down work off of Rashad and just try and take a little bit of a load off of him because they gave him quite a big load last year. Um, and, you know, he's really not the most efficient runner there. So I wonder if it's a very small amount of work that he steals, but maybe if Bucky does be more is can be more efficient throughout the year, that's something there. Um, Garendo really just like a stash guy, obviously, right? Like he's a guy that, you know, as you get into the fourth round of dynasty drafts, like I've taken him at the 409 a couple of times. Um, I actually, you know, traded up or traded back into the fourth the other day, you know, at the 411, just so he wouldn't hit waivers and I could get a chance to throw him on a taxi. Um, and then Braylon Allen, you know, what the Jets did by doubling up at running back here. I know we'll get to the other one in a little bit, but to take Braylon Allen to go behind Brees Hall, um, as the RB 11, by the way, which is why I had him. So for all those people telling me I was crazy about Braylon Allen, RB 11. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, um, but to land behind Brees Hall and then for them to go ahead and then take Isaiah Davis, who God damn it, New York jets, like Isaiah Davis was one of my fun flyers later on. And they went ahead and took both of them. I just, well, well. Look, yeah, seriously. And there goes any Izzy hope that was, that was had out there too. So look, obviously if Brees goes down, I think it's, I don't even know if there's a clear guy that like you could rely on. So like 
taxi guys at best, and I just don't even know what you can expect out of him. Will Shipley, look, fun player, but like you, Jalen Hurts doesn't throw the ball to running backs that much, and Saquon can catch the ball. So like I just, again, I some of these guys, it's, while they may have got decent impacts, it's it's really hard to see most of them making an impact in twenty four. Yeah, I feel you. I think like I think Jalen Wright could make some decent impact because Raheem Mostert will go down, and I think we saw that Devin A Chain could produce off of less volume. I don't see them making him a 20 carry back if Mostert goes down. Like I think Jalen Wright does get some serious run. Old Jeffy Wilson's still there, I believe, too. Um, if he's not a free agent, but I think if he no, is, I, saw, he probably... I read today though, I read today he was like a potential cut candidate at this point with Jalen Wright. So fair enough, too, right? Fair enough. But he's probably one of those guys where somebody gets hurt and they bring him back and then they release yeah, him exactly. because McDaniels loves him. Um, but I love Jalen Wright in that landing spot. And for the long term, he's easily my run, my top running back out of this fourth round group. Yeah. Uh, Bucky to me is a pure handcuff. Will Shifley, everything you said. Yeah, sure, great, uh, good offense. But if he's not getting carries, also not going to be getting targets. Ray yeah. Davis is such a bowling ball man. I see him like not necessarily the same player, but I could see him filling a similar role to what we saw from Devin Singletary as another kind mm -hmm. of short compact guy who can take some carries. Garendo, another stash similar to how we've been stashing Jordan Mason, Tyrion Davis Price, previously guys like Matt Breida, right? Um, another San Francisco running back that we just want to add to the bottom of our roster. And it's Braylon just crazy Allen, that like, look, like, the two like freakiest guys from a running back perspective, dude, they went to Miami and fucking San Francisco. Yeah, like it's insane. It, it really, I wonder if like Kyle Shanahan saw Jalen Wright go to Miami and he was like, fuck it, we're going to get our guy in Garendo. But yeah. yeah, like obviously Christian's there, but Elijah Mitchell is a undrafted free agent at the end of the year. So he's a guy that look, if he ever got a chance down the line, we're not saying this year, but down the line with the size speed freak that he is in a Kyle Shanahan offense just could be really fun. Yeah, exactly. And fantasy football is meant to be fun. Braylon Allen, yeah, still kind of hate him, but like if Brees Hall goes down, there's a fucking path, man. And like, I don't know, depending on where he goes in drafts, I think he's probably going to be people are still going to like him. Like Biggs had him as his mm. running back one going into the draft. Um, a lot of people were super high on him, like just from that kind of outlier perspective. Um, but to me, he was never Derrick Henry, so I never wanted him. You know what I mean? If, yeah. if you're that big, you need to be Derrick Henry for me. Yeah. Um, okay. Who is we're getting towards the tail end. We're going to rattle off some of these guys who came in the fifth, yeah. sixth and seventh. Still just appreciate everybody who's stuck around with us. It's been a long episode. Lots of good information happening. Yep. Chunk this one out into a couple sessions. Fair enough. And I'm going to try and make sure I get the timestamps on there. So you can click forward to the guys that you want to hear about. Um, but in the fifth round, Spencer Rattler went simple question. Will you be adding him to the taxi squad of your Superflex rosters? Yeah, I mean, look, there's probably a scenario where I don't mind doing that. Um, taking him in like a fourth round of a of a dynasty uh, rookie draft is fine with me um, if you don't like some of the options out there. But yeah, I think that's pretty much all there is to say there. Yeah, I think just as a blanket philosophy, it's never bad to throw these guys on your taxi squad. Yep. All you're hoping for is a few spot starts here and there. But if they get those, they're super useful. And then if they I get mean, any more of that, then you just cashed in. Look at Sam Howell. Right. Like yeah. that's a prime example of some guy going on the fifth and then having value, but bingo. Um, and then Jordan Travis, Joe Milton also went. I'm not going to touch too hard on Joe Milton whiz, but uh, I don't think those guys will necessarily be much. But again, no. you know, it doesn't hurt to add them to the bottom of the taxi if you got the spot. Sure. Running backs. And this is so this isn't just fifth round whiz, just for everybody listening. This is fifth, sixth, and seventh that I'm going to lay out because yeah, these guys are all dart throws. The chances that these guys hit is very low, but we want to talk about them anyway. So running backs that went in the final three rounds, Estime in the fifth to Denver, Rasheen Ali to Baltimore, Tyrone Tracy to the Giants, uh, Keelan Robinson, who I barely even knew anything about, to Jacksonville, Isaiah Davis to the Jets. Kamani Vidal, who we really like, went to the Chargers. That's a juice landing spot. Then Jace McClellan to the Falcons, Jawar Jordan to Houston, Dylan Lauby or Lob or however you want to pronounce it to the Raiders in the sixth. So I know you got the show sheet in front of you. I'm not going to rattle those names off again, Wiz, but tell me one or yeah. two guys that you have some interest in. Yeah. So one of the names that I definitely have some interest in is we talked about him with Barrett, but it's Tyron Tracy. Um, I think he landed in a pretty good spot with New York there. You know, really it's, it's Devin Singletary and then it's Tyrone Tracy. Um, you know, we saw him be pretty effective when he, look, he's a 
Uh, he was at Iowa, transferred to Purdue, and became transferred as a wide receiver and became a running back. So he's got those receiving chops out of the backfield. And he, you know, in the small sample size that he did have, he made some people miss from a missed tackles force per rush perspective, right? So, you know, only 148 attempts in college, but he was just behind Trey Benson in that missed tackles force per rush perspective. So exciting dart throw in the fourth round. I think the other guy, though, that I'm more excited about as far as being able to make a real impact here, Trav, is Kamani Vidal. Um, yeah. He's, he's definitely like he landed in Jim Harbaugh offense. You know, he's got, God bless him. He's got the corpse of, you will see the corpse potentially of JK Dobbins there. Like, I don't know how much he has left at this point. Um, and yeah, I know they signed Gus Edwards. Absolutely. But Vidal is one of the best packs pass blocking backs in this class. So I could see him even carving out a role on third down, like right away. Um, and, you know, if he can so show some of those receiving chops, which he did have at Troy, um, there's an option there. And look, he's not the most efficient guy in the world, but strong runner. So I just, I wouldn't be surprised if this became, if this job became his at some point during this year. And if that's the, you know, running back in a Jim Harbaugh offense, I'll take a dart throw on that guy. Yeah, man. And that offense, like, like that offense doesn't, it's going to have so much volume that he doesn't need efficiency. You know what I mean? Like if he can yeah. carve it out and I'll, I'll tell you, my candle is still burning for JK. Still burning for J.K. Dobbins, Ohio State fan, and loved him coming out. So, um, but yeah, that candle's flickering, though. I'll tell you that. Uh, I kind of like those guys. I, I don't know if I can agree on Tyrone Tracy for this fact. Was like Brian Dable NFL offenses just don't really throw to running backs. You know what I mean? In the Singletary years in Buffalo, obviously he's not a guy who's commanding targets. He was averaging in the neighborhood of forty-five targets a season. Um, then we look last year with Saquon Barkley. And then we look at the quarterback play, which was shit. Look at the wide mm -hmm. receivers, which were garbage. Saquon Barkley only got 60 targets last year. Um, and he's a guy who should be commanding those targets, who you should be scheming up targets for, especially devoid of yeah. wide receivers. And we didn't see Dable doing that. And so that's like my only thought there is that I'm not sure that Tracy's going to come in and get a bunch of rushes. So I yeah. think he's going to need to carve out those targets that could be one of his only ways to produce. And I just don't know if those are going to be there. So... That's my hesitation on but I want it. Like aside from the fact that it's on the Giants, I would love to see him succeed in that role for sure. Um, yeah, Deep Rasheen sleeper. Ali. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah I was, it, nope. You you had it. Deep sleeper Rasheen for Ali. me. Is, yeah. yeah. Rasheen Ali. Like look, him. he's he's obviously fifth round guys. So these guys are pretty much all dart those at this point. But look, I think he's he's got a path to be like I I know Justice Hill's still there. But if Derrick Henry ever went down at some point, this could happen. I know we keep saying that, but. Look, he's next to free. He's going to be free in most drafts. Um, definitely just a guy to keep an eye on if you have room on your taxi. Yeah, definitely just a taxi guy. But shout out to Dev, one of our graphics dudes, big Rasheen Ali fan. And Baltimore is a backfield that we attach to. So even yeah. the third stringer, fourth stringer, at the right price, I will add that guy to the bottom of my roster because look at what happened with Keaton Mitchell last year. Um, and mm -hmm. he's a guy who's going to be in this offense as well in 2024, coming back off that big injury. So um, just like Baltimore running backs, I think that's pretty well wrapped up. I mean, Dylan Lobb, we got some some truthers in the uh, in the undroppables team, but he's really just going to need to carve out a ton of targets. Kind of similar to uh, some of that Tracy talk that we had there, because I don't that's think fair. they're ever going to trust him with the majority carry share. Um, not going to go into the UDFAs, just to mention that Blake Watson, a guy that we kind of liked as the deepest of sleepers, did go as a UDFA to Denver, kind of dirt naps him because he's buried behind a bunch of guys, including Estime, who they drafted with a fifth round pick. Um, Frank Gore Jr. went to Buffalo. I think it's just kind of sweet to see a gore there um maybe like honestly there is a world where if ray davis doesn't work everything we just said about ray davis could translate over to frank gore as kind of that bowling ball carries guy um, yeah. but it's hard to bank on that especially with them actually using some draft capital on ray davis versus not on frank sure. gore so very interesting i know you have a couple of wide receiver names in this group that you kind of like Wiz. so i'm gonna I don't know if I need to lay them out necessarily. I know that nah. you have them in front of you, but let's tell the listeners about a couple of super late round guys. Like we're talking fifth round of rookie drafts, if drafted at all. But give me a couple of those receivers late that you're looking at. Yeah, I think the number one receiver late is, you know, it's a guy that I've seen go drafted in the fourth, but also a guy that I have seen go undrafted as well uh, that I have claims in on. And it's Malik Washington. Um, went to Miami and I got to say, I saw the phone call where like the video after where McDaniel's on the phone with 
Malik. And I guess he was like bugging the GM to draft him for like the two rounds before. So like you always, you always love to see that, but like, look at the end of the day, he's a sixth round wide receiver, but he's in a Mike McDaniel offense. We've heard rumors that Tyreek may be retiring in a couple of years. Again, it, it's a dart throw here, but it's one of the more fun dart throws that you can make. If I'm going to make dart throws, I want them to be attached to, to good offenses that if this guy does get a shot that with his athleticism, with some of the stuff that we saw in college, Malik Washington is a fun guy. The other fun guy or like could be interesting guy is Anthony Gould. Um, he's definitely one um, in Indy. Again, it would probably take an injury to get him going a little bit, but he's someone. And then the last one is just is Ryan Florney. Uh, in Dallas, I, I think there is a world there where, like, look, he's he's kind of a bigger athletic guy. He's like six, over six feet, over 200 pounds, um, has flashed a little bit of times. Again, these are taxi squad guys at this point. These are some of the guys I'm keeping an eye on just to kind of fill out that taxi. Yep. I like those names. Uh, Malik Washington was one of my faves throughout the draft process and just seeing yeah. he went to Miami, like he, he could be their wide receiver three this season. And if the yep. coach is the one pounding the table, the coach is the one who puts these guys on the field. So that's nothing yeah. but a good sign for Malik Washington. Yeah. I thought he was going to be up in like the fourth round of the real NFL draft. You know what I mean? But kind of did too. another slider. Uh, one name that you didn't mention there is Johnny Wilson, not mm. the best profile. Lots of, he was really polarizing. People liked him or people hated him. Yep. massive body don't think he converts to tight end necessarily um but i think you never know he could give them a little bit of versatility if he were to carve out a little bit on the outside think of like what the eagles have been doing with quez watkins as of late mm -hmm. you know what i mean they did bring in Devonte parker who i think mans that third wide receiver spot oh, um, but he hasn't been one to stay on the field forever and i think maybe in in the eagles offense we don't love the wide receiver three but one of these other guys goes down could be some big opportunity. And I think some of that just allows them to maybe push Devonte in the slot, push AJ Brown into the slot a little bit more and having a guy who can be competent on the outside when they're doing that. Um, and then another guy that we've talked about a little bit, and we talked about Lad McConkey, uh, Brendan Rice was drafted in the seventh mm. round of the draft. And don't know if he's necessarily going to blow up or be anything, but we know his dad was drafted super late and exploded. Not saying he's going to necessarily do what his dad did, but I think if we look at Quentin Johnston, we look at Josh Palmer, those are guys that were not brought into the Chargers by this regime. Brendan Rice was. So in uh, a weak depth chart, we know that Lad's probably at the top. Never know with Brendan Rice. Definitely a taxi stash. Wiz, that's about a wrap, it. my guy. We did it. We did it. It's a uh, seven rounds. So we went through all seven rounds, talked about all of the players that we deem fantasy relevant if there's any we missed please hit the comments and let us know we'd love to see yep. it if you have any that you want to pull out of those haystacks and tell us that we missed i'm happy to see it um but yeah just thanks for sticking around it's a bit of a marathon episode it's been a really big week for the brand like we mentioned the un score is live go to the undroppables.com get it for 20 bucks or sign up for the patreon expert tier and you will get the 2024 class for free and then you get a discount code to get 2018 through to 2023 for only a 10 spot. So super good value there as what we like to call a super important tool in your tool belt, a nice guide, some stats in there as well. It's a 54 page document. So yep. lots of fun to be had as you're combing through and shout out to yourself with Jax, Chalk, Jay, and Fantasy Dukes, who we know was up to the 11th hour getting that beautiful piece of work done last night. So what a gosh. huge shout out for the team. And thanks to everybody who's been soaking it up and commenting and letting us know what they think about it, because that's what makes us all worth it is when we see you guys pick it up and start reading it and telling us you like it. So super cool stuff there was and just follow us on youtube we're going to be going all off season long this yep. is Wiz. we're only about four or five episodes into our tenure together probably not even and yeah. uh if i do say so myself i feel like we are already becoming a well-oiled machine so if you like the show leave a comment on youtube that helps us a lot we are also on spotify and i'm working to get us on other platforms but it's just been a bit of a slog been super busy with kind of getting led up to the draft so as time permits, as it should, as we move through the off season, we will be on more audio platform forms for you. Anything I missed there, follow us on Twitter at the undroppables. Wiz, you got any parting shots for the people, man? 
I will say that was just professionally well done. Um, you hit absolutely everything there. So, um, no, just to echo a couple of um, Trav's comments there, guys, we really do appreciate you checking everything out that we've been doing lately. Um, you know, please continue that feedback on some of the UN score stuff. We'd love to kind of discuss that with you and answer any questions that you may have. But yeah, Trav, this was fun, man. I think it's I think it's really good to kind of get a lay of the land initially after the draft. And, you know, as these rookie drafts are starting up right now for some people. So this was perfect. And then, you know, it's a nice little kind of appetizer as we get into best ball season now that the draft is over and everything like that. So what'll be really cool is tracking some of these guys and these conversations that we had today, how those play out through mini camps, how those play out through summer camps and everything like that. So this was a great start to the, the real off season post draft, right? Absolutely. And the fun starts here, man. Keep it dialed with unraveled. Keep it dialed with the undroppables. Check us out on socials and you know that Wiz and I will be mobbing on the YouTube channel weekly, including all of our other shows. So shout out to them. If you subscribe, you will find them. Hit the notifications. You won't miss an episode. Like the episode. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you thought. Until next week, that's Wiz. I'm Trav. Peace. <laughs>